And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always <coughs> is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadara Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, <laughs> good brother Xanatrix. We are back once again with Veil with Veil of the Void. This time, calling an audible because because of the because of um, page counts, which is wh which is why you're get which is why you're going to be seeing a chapter throughout this on the image that is not what we're going to be focusing on entirely. So, last time around, we went into the general mechanics and we had to do a, a bit of skimming and it was a bit surface level because. Well, it's the general die mechanics. Although, yeah, I will say that it that it did. It's a dice. The D six die system we have to deal with with Veil of the Void is not too far removed from what we've had to deal with in, say, Shadowrun. But you're not needing to deal with as many dice. Maximum cap of a of sixteen, maybe seventeen. Mm-hmm. And. I do I do like the I do like the way they um the way the die intersect in this system. It's a it is it's a very it's a it's a very nice way to give some give some flavor to it so it's not as binary with its pass and fail. Yeah. But for this one this is Technically, going to be covering two avenues because because one of them we kind of have to cover, and the other, and the other one I planned on, but splitting this into two would result in one really short entry and one slightly longer entry. So best to do the fusion dance with both of them. Indeed. And that is going to bring us to character creation, which. Whether we should have done this first or af or after the core mechanics is debatable, but a um, little too late for that. I will note that unlike some of our previous valleys, we will be jumping around in the chapter order, largely because it's more about it, this is more about the personal feel that I usually approach these kind of things with. Mm -hmm. Plus, if we were to do it by chapter by chapter order, there would there would be um, a few awkward moments. More than a few, I would say. Mm -hmm. Now, it it opens up by, by now chapter one, which is discussing character creation, opens with referring to it as a story focused rule set. The idea, the idea, as they say it is, our rules put an emphasis on story and character progression. This means that you can create any character you like. The rules give structure, but aren't meant to imprison you. We've designed them to encourage creativity and give your and give room for your character to grow. If there is a unique idea you want to try, discuss it with your GM. You can work together to bring your your idea to life. You know, I hear a lot of games do the whole oh you can create any you can create any character, and a lot of times, reality likes to is often disappointing. Yeah. Oh. I but I, I think. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I think the important thing to point out is that as we discussed with the first episode, um, where they said uh, you can, you know, use this rule set for any anything, um, I kind of pointed out that maybe they mean just the core rule set and not any of the setting or anything else. Yeah, that is that is. More, um. I remember. I remember speaking. I remember speaking with Trevor about it, and that isn't too far off from the intent. Okay. Um. The reason, part of the reason that I that I end up finding that kind of th that kind of thing amusing, is because well, we hear we hear that from the bigger names, and in truth, there are bi there are builds that you can't do. Like my own um Aldine, the character who who you may have who you all may have seen in the last few reviews that I do. I will be flat out honest with you. I couldn't. I um, I would not be able to do that character in most editions of D and D, unless I house ruled the fuck out of it. 
Yeah, um, I'm I'm pretty sure Aldine would be uh, easier to do in. I mean, if we're gonna be purely uh, purely biased about this, you could make Aldine easier in something like Exalted than you could D and D. Yeah, it'd be fairly easier to it'd be fairly easy to make her a water aspect dragon blooded in Exalted, or give her the water divine word in um, Godbound. Exactly. Whereas in some in something like D and D, uh, because of the fact that they want everybody to ha to draw upon every spellcaster to draw upon a certain list and not and be kind of a generalist. Aldine's whole focus of of using magic for this one specific thing in this one specific style is going to be incompatible. And you know that also the whole using magic in a specific way for a specific thing uh, could actually fit. I feel some supers systems, but then you know super systems are nearly universal systems to start with, so. I have an easier time fitting her into super systems. That's that's never been a um, ish, a issue. Yeah. So Aldine has a very very unique, uh, I guess, construction. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that something so ubiquitous as D and D, which really shouldn't be as ubiquitous as it is, um would not be able to fit her. And I know some people I know some people would go but what but what about the what about the whole thing with hex with um hexblade like warlocks? One small one small problem. They're st even even the even they are not going to be as good are not going to be a true frontline fighter. And well, Aldine is Aldine is very much meant to be a frontline fighter. It's even harder to make a make Xan in just about any system, to be honest. Well, that, uh. well you could always use the Immortals Handbook. <laughs> <sighs> well, or I could use my original Xan. A, Completely broken character, relegated to the Hall of Heroes as it is. But we don't need someone who's outside causality anymore. Yeah. And well, as far well, as far as the one that as far as the approach we use as your current avatar, that'd be that'd be easier. Although easier. Although a lot of game. Although with certain games, I would I would be against it simply because they simply because they wouldn't be able to handle the stylish aspects you know because apparently ev apparently every um every ma every um weapon based combatant is supposed to just do basic attack all fucking day whereas Zan is um I mean Aldine strikes me as a very precise fighter she's a weapon mistress yes and, and thus very precise you can mow through people pretty quickly um Zan is just kind of a battlefield force. Like, tactical weapon level. <laughs> yeah. He and uses the he uses his metal to create electromagnetic bursts, because nobody realizes that spinning two pieces of metal of different types together creates electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. But get but getting pa getting past that. And getting getting back on the getting back on the rails. Rails, um, yeah. The uh, that that whole thing of being able, of being able to potentially create any character is something we'll probably end up coming back to later later on in this um, series. Yeah, I I think I think claims like that are, are I feel like they miss the picture uh, in some cases, um, just because of the fact that. Well, maybe every character you can think of, the, the, the creators of the system, can be covered. But then there's people like you and I who might think of something completely off the wall. Yeah, and 
the reason we the reason I you I I wanted to bring up those two examples is not is not to do not to do some sort of ad populum argument of oh 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 you could oh check oh checkmate designer because you couldn't come up you couldn't figure out this one specific thing. No, I bring that kind of thing up because if it's that easy to to come up with a concept that has that has issues with the more popular entries that make this that make this sort of claim that aren't universal games, you know, the one and claim to and claim to allow for any character, then it stands to reason that anyone could come, could could um create this exact same problem. Yeah. Now they do get, now there is a now um within the set, within the setup for that whole f getting back to the matter at hand it says when creating a character consider what you would like to be able to do perhaps you want to be a high health character who, that also uses magic you could pick the field knight class and invest a point into the arcanting skill this would make you a mobile high health magic wielding character what if instead you want a character more versed in magic but can still take hits like a tank you could build a Thalmatech with proficiency in heavy armor and use earth magic and enchants. There are many ways to build what you want. With the expertise and skills, species, and classes, you have the tools to build whatever you can imagine. Those are two interesting examples, because the Gish is a popular fantasy that a lot of games end up getting wrong, as we, ta as we talked about. Yep. Um, Gishes are... You tend to see successful gishes more often in non-games, like books and movies and TV, than you do in tabletop. <clears throat> Universal or, games notwithstanding, of course. Yes, we're not talking about Besom, which is, you know, literally meant to be a, a semi-universalist anime-based game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or GURPS. Fuck GURPS. <laughs> I don't need that amount of mathematics in my life right now. Thank you. I don't hate Gur I don't hate GURPS, but I do hate the idea that pe that people keep insisting that it's the only game that I need. Um, same goes for Hero System, although I don't hear this from Hero System as much. At the very least, Hero System recently put out a recently put out a thing to. At least, at least help guide people into into play, into playing champions. It's it's something that it's something maybe we'll cut maybe we'll cover down the road. But at the very least, it's an attempt. I don't I haven't seen a GURPS quick start in quite a while. But and. Anyway, we move. We getting back to the matter at hand. We I know I said that a minute ago, but we move on to it saying a focus on flavor. Saying with these rules, we tried to encourage flavor, the creative side of role playing. Just because a rule states one thing doesn't mean you can't make it something else. If you keep the same function, you can flavor it as you like. And it gives we... an example. I okay. So the example says. You're playing a naturalist and start with an archaic pistol for a weapon, but you'd prefer something different. You can flavor it to be more natural. Your character might instead launch bursts of uh, naturic energy from a staff. Maybe you summon spirit animals to attack the target. If they share the same stats of the pistol, you're able to do it. Mm. I know in previous discussions we've kind of ragged on this type of reflavoring mindset before. Like, in other games that we've discussed and looked at, if you did use a pistol versus a staff versus some spirit animals, maybe they'd all share the same damage type, but they would act very differently at a, even a mechanical level uh, on games that are trying to emphasize you know, that sort of customizability. Mm -hmm. I mean, hell, if we did it in FF Legend, it, the, all three of those things, maybe they all do 1d6 damage, but they would each do that 1d6 damage in very different ways. Yes. But it, it goes, and this is just the basics. Your character is yours. 
Be as creative as possible, get invested in their story, work with your GM and other players to build a living story. Um, I know we've harped we've harped on the whole focus on flavor and story focused rule set. We don't mean to be harsh at this in the moment. It's more of this is get this is going to be some this is going to be a point of a point of judgment down the road. Or to put to put it in video game terms, the monastery will remember this. <laughs> but we hate Telltale Games, Monk. I don't hate all of them. Just the just the just the way it, just the way the company became an Icarus. Yeah. No. Um. I think the the biggest like the the way that this will be a point of judgment is when we've seen this in other systems in the past. This is treated as some. Uh, panacea bandage. Oh, you can do whatever you want, whatever you imagine. Just change the flavor of whatever you're doing and keep the mechanics the same. Is it really going to feel different when you're rolling 1d6 for damage for your archaic pistol versus rolling 1d6 for damage for the thing you've now flavored as spirit animals that attack a person? Mm. It's It's going to feel the same. You might describe it differently, but it's going to feel the same. And that's the issue I'm always worried about with this sort of flavor it however you'd like thing. Mm -hmm. Now next we go into leveling up. The game has levels. Levels represent your character's experience in their story. The GM will give you a starting level that affects what class abilities you can choose from. As you go through the game, you'll get additional levels when you reach story milestones. Um, I'm perfect. The one thing I want to take away from this is story milestones being the determining factor of leveling up instead of, say, experience. I abandoned experience as a GM myself a long time ago. Um, unless it's unless it's a game where you spend experience to up uh, to update specific skills and such, such as um, World of Darkness games. But yeah. most of the time, if you've got you're going to get features when you get to next level, and you need X amount of XP to get to next level. Well, that's all well and good for some games. Most games, I'm just like, either the amount of experience you're getting is too much, and you're leveling up too much, or, more commonly, the amount of experience your players are getting is too little. Or you could, ha or you could have the AD&D problem, where, every where everybody gets dip everybody levels up at different thresholds. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> and I'm I know, fine. I know somebody's gonna say, but what about the what about the level adjustment that was in Anima for the, for the non Nephilim races? You're already can with with the, in that case you're already che you're already um all that really ha all that really happens is the stu is um you're getting a bunch of stuff ridiculously earlier than everybody else like if you were mm -hmm. if you were ju if you were just a human so that's what that's what you're paying and that's why I don't mind that's why I didn't mind that particular setup cuz well for starters the only way to get those non nephilim races is to dig into them in the gm book and second of all of all you get a lot of stuff from that from those picks you're essentially taking a loan mhm mm the entire reason you get the, the, the level adjustment or the reduced XP gain or anything of that nature in any game, not just Anima, but in any game that, that does that, is because in most cases, whatever you're choosing, you're getting some really overpowered shit early. Also, the, also the book out, outright warns you about that kind of thing. Basically, mm -hmm. don't don't throw this kind of thing on new play on new players because that might be pushing it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't that's why I don't mind it. But the the varying XP thing that was that was done or that was done for AD and D, I always thought that was fucking stupid. Even when I was starting out, because mm -hmm. of the fact that it's never really justified. It's AD and D was trying to do this idea of balancing characters across an entire campaign, which is bold of them to assume that a that that a campaign will go that far. Some campaigns are shorter, some campaigns are longer. Sometimes your players will come across and find a way to fuck your campaign to Timbuktu. 
and it ends early. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the point is, I tend to I tend to prefer um, story milestone le- leveling. The only t- the only time that I really don't do that and instead do it based on how many encounters the party has survived is in hex crawls because there's no story in a hex crawl. You're just there to kill shit. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we have five steps for character creation. Which it says you can complete these steps in any order. Um, step one, pick a species. I actually um do want to read this note just before we go further. Mm-hmm. There's a note that says, Before you begin, think of a character idea, no matter how crazy... Then use the steps to make that idea a reality. So should we should we actively create a character here, Monk? Or, or at least just kind of keep a tally mark in our heads? Mm. <laughs> hold I'm not saying I'm not saying no, but hold that thought because it wasn't until we got to classes when we were doing Heavens and Heresies that we even fielded certain character concepts. True. Very true. So, but um, to continue the joke, Zan will remember that. Mm-hmm. But and anyways, we have uh, now. I'm not going to go through the. I'm not going to go through the description of each of the species as it's written here because we're going to be going through the more detailed version later on tonight. But we have the Celestia, the Dalkindrith, the Elon, the Exiled, the Humans, the Corians the prototypes, and the reapers. As a note, I will state that the prototypes is prototypes. Mm-hmm. P-R-O-T-A. Yep. Oh, and I, f- yep. I, forgot, I forgot about the topkin, or the topikin. Indeed. Yep. And that goes into species history, species sta- um, stats, Traits and ancestral paths. So with history, self self explanatory. Um, species stats goes through average lifespan, height, speed, and known languages. But those but but those are well averages. Yeah, and it's and it's uh, not extremely mechanical. Mm-hmm. Let's see, next is traits. You gain you have a list of traits. Each species has a list of traits. You gain all traits from that list. And then ancestral paths. In addition to paths, each species has several ancestral paths to choose from. You choose one of the paths out of the available species path. These allow for more individuality within a species. Take note of any bonuses this ability gives to a virtues or skills and add them to at steps 3 and 4 respectively. So, while they did say you can do any of the five um, the five steps in order earlier, I think that doing something like choosing your species first just makes the most sense, since there are things that dr- that trickle down from it into other um, other places. Yeah. Now, step two is picking your class. Which is described as your character's profession, and I think most pe- I think most people watching this are familiar with a con- with a concept of a character class in one form or another. Um, there are ten classes total in the book, and because of the fact that we're not going to be getting to classes tonight, um, I do want to go into the description given for each of them on this page. Okay, yeah, we so, can do that. First is architect. Architects are master craftsmen and built and engineers. They collect scrap throughout their travels and use it to bring their ideas to life. Their control over mechs and robotic creations are second to none. Gentry going up. <laughs> it's fucking engineer. You cannot tell me that that is not fucking engineer. No, I can't. No, no lies detected. Oh God, maybe there's a TF2 person for each and every one of these. Let's see, combat medic. <laughs> You're not helping. <laughs> <clears throat> Combat medics are healers. 
Though focused more on health management than pure healing, their unique weapons allow them to steal health points from adversaries or themselves and use those points to heal allies. Oh. Next is Field Knight. The Field Knight is a mobile fighter that can take high damage. They begin with jetpacks and rocket boots, and high strength lets them drag adversaries along with them. With rocket-equipped weapons, they inflict more damage, and the more they hit, the stronger they get. Hi, soldier! <laughs> if fighting will assure in victory, then you must fight! Sun Tzu said Ooh. that! And I'd say he knows a little more about fighting than you do, pal, because he invented it! And then he perfected it. <laughs> so we've already got engineer. We've already got medic. We've already got soldier. Let's go practice medicine. <sighs> Next is the Mechromancer. Not to be confused with Techromancer. Good game, by the way. Techromancer! The spellcasting Mechromancer consumes the life essence of fallen adversaries to grow stronger. Storing this essence in their weapons lets them summon undead mechanical minions and cast potent spells. I... I can't really attach that to... The streak has been broken. <sighs> Sad face. So, oh well. <laughs> next is the Mimic. Mimics are a defensive class specializing in reactions. With quick thinking and connection to the Realm of Reflection, they reduce incoming damage and launch an adversary's attacks back against them. Pyro! <laughs> I told you I could still make some connections! Ha ha! Ha 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 Yep. Oh. Uh. So only next... did the, the realm of reflection just sounds exactly like pyrovision to me. That that and it does it doesn't exactly hurt that one of the big tactics that you'd have to use as pyro is air blasting rockets. Mm-hmm. Although I distinctly remember someone made a someone made a map mod that was basically the most dangerous form of tennis, just or the most dangerous form of racquetball, just instead of a ball. You're bouncing a rocket back and forth as two pyros. Mm hmm. Um. Anyway, Naturalist is next. Naturalists are the spellcasting devout of Elanath the Eternal Queen, the aspect of life. Sounds like an elf. She grants her followers a more powerful book to summon the wrath of nature itself. They also specialize in summoning creatures and healing spells. Many of them can even manipulate the strands of fate itself as they grow. Mm, mm -mm. Druid. Druid, but nothing from TF2 comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Except for maybe Mr. Man himself. Mm -hmm. Next is Negotiator. Negotiators are talkers. They use their manipulation tactics to interrupt and distract adversaries while simultaneously assisting their allies. This class focuses on the power of their words and would rather talk through their problems. And when the talking fails, we always go to our knives. <laughs> it's spy. Yep. Let's see, next is Smuggler. The greatest pilots and gunslingers are smugglers. They attack before combat even begins and favor debilitating ammo. They're well-versed on the holes to hide, the alleyway shortcuts, and where to sell not-so-legal goods. Bonk! Yeah, I was about to say, that's Scout. Yeah. That's totally Scout. <laughs> um, next is Soldier. Soldiers are cybernetically enhanced fighters. They are proficient with nearly every weapon as their cybernetics grant bonuses based on what weapon they are wielding. Their core give, gives additional powerful effects as well as a few fun role-playing aspects. I am Heavy Weapons Guy. Yeah. And this is my weapon. People say that they can outsmart heavy weapons guy. Maybe. Maybe. I have yet to see anyone who can outsmart Bullet. And last we have the Thaumatech. The Thaumatech is a spellcasting class that switches between elemental USBs. Fire, earth, water, and air. 
Their spells stored in their weapons can overcharge their casting power and damage. Later, they manipulate the most potent magic. Yeah, that's Demo Man. I mean, except for the elemental thing, but that's Demo Man. What as makes, a demo? <laughs> what what makes me a good Demo Man? If I were a bad Demo Man, I wouldn't be sitting here discussing it with you now, would I? Exactly. So while the Necromancer doesn't. And the, and the naturalists don't fit the schema, and thus we have nobody for Sniper to inhabit. Sad face. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could technically put Sniper on Smuggler as well, but then you have Scout and Sniper in the same place. No, oh, but the the whole sh the whole <sighs> attacking before combat even begins. Yeah, that's Scout. It's not only is it Scout; it's a reminder that Han shot first. Of course, it's a Smuggler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, uh, I guess nobody in this game is deserving of the grand art of Jurati. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay. Anyway, we go on to abilities. Every ability listed in the class has a level at which it's unlocked. Once unlocked, you have that ability for the game's duration. At level 5, you can choose from one of the many specializations. Well, you get specializations at... You get specializations at 5, huh? It is important to note that if an ability says it may target an ally, that includes yourself. If it states another ally, it does not include yourself. Good thing to point that out. Then we go custom classing. A unique class ability or specialization is noted by a asterisk symbol. Unique abilities can only be taken by the class it is under. I'm get I'm guessing that I'm guessing that's to Oh, Actually, it's already answered. As you level, you may choose to take the non-unique ability of another class instead of your current level ability. This ability must be of an equal level. That is the e that is one of the easiest idiot-proof forms of multi-classing we have seen in a while. Yeah. Um. I mean, the uh, the only easier one we've seen is is uh, Heavens and Heresies. Your multi-classing is literally done by magic trinkets. As you so, uh, as you so famously found out with your human fighter using reckless attack from barbarian. Yeah, it cost me one vitality to use it, but I can still use it. Exactly. Uh, then we have starting proficiencies. Every weapon, armor, and item under this section represents what your character is already good with slash used to using. When you purchase an item at character creation, you automatically gain proficiency with it. Oh, that so is interesting. Yeah, I was about to say, so if it, your class comes with things you're already good at using, but then if you purchase an item at character creation, you get proficiency with that item as well. Mm -hmm. That's... That's interesting. Let's see, then we have HP and leveling HP. HP is, is health points. I will eternally call it hit points because old habits die hard. And... All classes start with 10 plus vitality for in HP at character creation. As no, level... 12. 12 plus vitality. Yeah, 12 plus vitality in HP at character creation. As your character levels up, you gain additional HP depending on which class you chose. <clears throat> they either gain a set HP each level or roll for it for a chance to get more HP. So not too far removed from the from the HP at additional levels thing that stuff like 5e does, except nobody takes it. Mostly because the, mostly because the static level is shit. Uh, yeah. Example: A naturalist adds 1d6 or 3 plus vitality to their ma to their max HP. So that's going unless their vitality virtue is a zero. That's going to assure that they get more than the average. As, oppo as opposed to, say, 5e, which would just have it, in this kind of thing, would just have it be 3. Yep, it does uh, half, and you ha and if it's if the half is bad, I know it's half plus 1, I think. So anybody with 1d6 HP gets 4. Mm -hmm. But then plus your con mod, so. Let's see, then we get... Then we go into starting items. This is a list of all items and credits. This universe's currency you have at the start of 
eat of the game. Credits can be spent on other items from the equipment section in Chapter 6. Uh, then we get to Step 3, Virtues. Regardless of the species or class you choose, all characters have the same six virtues. Power, finesse, vitality, mentality, judgment, and charm. Power is brute strength, so strength. Finesse is flexibility, dexterity, there it is. I think finesse is a better word than, dexte than dexterity, since dexterity kind of implies um, hand-related hand things. Well, and it also implies usually fine dexterity, hmm. not just things like your agility and flexibility and speed. Yeah. So uh, finesse is better. They were always called finesse weapons in uh, in D&D, so, I mean, see, why not? Vita vitality measures your max health, durability, and resistance. Con. Mentality measures your mental skill, intelligence, and recollection. It's right there. And judge, judgment, oh, judgment measures your wisdom, awareness, insight, and sanity. And charm measures your charisma, eloquence, leadership, and persuasion. I do, I do like the fact that we are not dealing with the um, charisma appearance problem that's ha that's happened for decades. Yeah, this this is literal. It literally spells out for you. This is your force of personality, how well you are at talking, how well you are at leading, whether you can persuade people. Charisma has always been about force of personality, and too many people equate it with how good you look. Which, I, rem I remember when one of my students tried to do that, and I said, how, how many good-looking actors do you know? How many good-looking how many good -looking actors do you know? How many, how many of them have something actually interesting to say? I rest my case. Keanu Reeves. Actually, you know what? In, in hindsight, I should have used, instead of actors, I should have used models. <laughs> yeah, models would have been a bit more accurate there. Although the, actors, actors have to at least be able to be eloquent to although, get on screen. Although these days, I could probably just use e-girls, and I'd get the same point across. Or... Any I would influencer. I would point out people like Pokimane and Amaranth. Oh yeah, Twitch thoughts. Yeah. Oh. Uh, anyway, each character begins with three points in each virtue. You are given. F you are then given five points to distribute between all six. Um, uh, I was about to say what the cap is, but then it explains it. You may not put more than two points into a single virtue at level one, not including your ancestral path. If you create a character of higher level, you may invest the two points and then add additional points. After you invest these virtue points, you may add any additional vir virtue points you get from your chosen species ancestral path. This additional virtue point may not may bring the virtue above five. Um. Oh. I know I said I may, not, may not for a second, but I corrected myself, so... There's a nice example here, too. You chose to play a Celestia Field Knight. You invest your virtues as follows. Power, 5, so you added 2 points. Finesse, 3, you added 0 points. Vitality, 4, you added 1 point. Mentality, 4, you added 1 point. Judgment, 3, you added 0 points. Charm, 4, you added 1 point. You then chose the Ancestral Path Essence of uh, Draca which grants you plus one to your power virtue. So your new total would be power six, finesse three, vitality four, mentality four, judgment three, charm four. Mm. And so the, the example here is to show that at level one, if you have a path that would put you above five, it's allowed to do so. But uh, I think what's really fun here is that everything starts at three. You get five points to split up between places, and um, because of that, n the whole uh, a naturalist adds 1d6 or 3 plus vitality virtue. Now, the question I have here is a naturalist adds 1d6 or 3 plus vitality virtue. Is that vitality virtue added to the 1d6 role as well? Because that's not a very clear statement. We'll probably, end, we'll probably end up getting to that when we actually get to 
classes proper. Possibly. Or... Yeah, probably. I, I just... I have to ask that question now because as part of character creation, I'd really like to know whether that vi that plus vitality virtue goes to both of those methods. Mm -hmm. Either either way, I appreciate that there is that there isn't as much of the issue of dump statting. You can't really dump stat when everything starts at an average. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And virtues affect how many dice you roll with on checks, which we've already talked about. Each class has a primary virtue. This is typically the best stat to invest points into for your class, but don't feel forced to specifically invest points there. For Architect and Combat Medic, it's Vitality. For not for Mentality, not Vitality. What the hell am I saying? For Field Knight, it's Vitality. For Necromancer, it is Power. For Mimic and Naturalist, it is Judgment. For Negotiator, it's Charm. For Smuggler and Soldier, it's Finesse. And for Thalmatech, it is vit it is mentality. Interesting that out of the um, out of the stats, only only three classes have a stat that isn't paired anywhere else, and that's Field Knight, Necromancer, and Negotiator, who are vitality, power, and charm, respectively. Mm -hmm. Mentality, judgment, and finesse get used by multiple classes, and with uh, mentality being the highest. Interesting. Let's see. Then we get to skills and expertise. So, which is of co which is going to be step four. So, for, so with skills at level one, you are given five skill points to invest. You cannot invest more than two points into one skill at level one. You may add any additional bonus skill levels you get from your species or class after distribution. Then we have the example of the Celestia Field Knight again. You invest two points into the Muscle skill, and one into the Analysis skill. Field Knights gain a plus one bonus in Muscle, Weapons Mastery, or Defense during creation as well. You could invest that additional point into the Muscle skill. So much like with the, um, the Ancestral Paths, if your class gives you something extra above that maximum, you can add that in. Mm -hmm. And then I like this last little note here. If you invest a single point into Arcanting and you are not playing a natural spell casting class, you gain access to spells. You start with two non-unique spells and one mystic. That's fucking cool. It also means you don't have to jump through a... Bu so for en this also means that anyone can theoretically become a Gish... Yeah. Without having to jump through, I, w I won't even say I won't even say jump through a bunch of hoops because let's be honest, with some games that do the gish that do the gish thing to be effective, you have to serve you have to survive a full round of of um, Takashi's Castle. Mm hmm. Or mm -hmm. For, or for our or for our contemporaries or for the people too too young for that, you have to survive a whole round of American Ninja Warrior or Wipeout. <laughs> <laughs> Takashi's Castle is still better. Oh, it it is. Um, I haven't seen I haven't seen enough of the original version Ninja Warrior um, Sasuke, so I can't comment on that. Sasuke isn't uh is a little more intense, but it's not funny like Takashi's Castle can be. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, next is expertise. Which is which is meant to help advance your character beyond their base potential. Many expertise can dynamically change your gameplay. For example, the well, we have, so it looks like expertise are our feats, <laughs> feats, knacks, whichever you whichever you'd want to call it. That thing that gives you extra stuff. And we have an example with spellblade. Which can allow you to enchant your weapons with a spell, granting a single spell during an attack, even if you do not have any points invested into our canting. <laughs> this is a chance to turn a field knight into a mystic knight, monk. Yes, it is. At character creation, you have five expertise points to spend. There are many expertise to choose from, and if you do not see any that you like or that fit your character, talk with your GM. 
Together, you can create something to fit your vision. If your class gives you an expertise at a later level that you already have, you would gain an expertise point instead. Very nice. So you don't get screwed out. Nice future-proofing. Something I do need to point out. Mm -hmm. Very, very simple system here. Everything is fives at level one. Five points to spend on your virtues, five points to spend on your skills, five points to spend on expertises. That's, that's fucking good. That's very user-friendly and very intuitive. Oh, Big E would love this. <laughs> <laughs> and step, step five is background. The previous <laughs> step's done. It's time to, fill the, time to build a background for your character. Fleshing out your backstory helps build a unique character and gets you invested in the overall story. It also helps your GM come, with, come up with the future stories that feature your character's history. Make sure you speak with your GM about the universe they are running so you can write a background that fits in the universe. This allows your character to be more believable. If you're having difficulties creating a backstory or want a detailed background, ask yourself these three questions. Who were they before their adventure? Why did they leave? What does your character want? If this is your first time making a, back, making a character's backstory, or would like to add even more to your backstory, answer the questions on pages 182 to 184. I'm suddenly reminded of the 20 questions that's in L5R. Yeah. Yeah. Huh, I, I'm, I'm going to take a quick look for just to, just to see what that little questionnaire looks like. So 182 to 184, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it does go over those three questions, adds a fourth one about our canting, but then there's a bunch of details inside of that. Uh... <clears throat> And so it, it takes it takes those three questions and expands them. Yes. And I obviously we'll get into more details about this later, but yeah, yeah, that's this is a lot like the twenty questions, man. Mm -hmm. That's hey, what have we been saying when we do FF Legend projects? You know, take the pieces that make the most sense. Yeah. I'd say that I'd say that applies here. Oh yeah, it's good too. I love it. Mm -hmm. So with the, with that with that in mind, the the next page that would have been after that it would be rules, but we already covered that. So yep. we are going to be skipping right over the chapter four and go and delving into species. Man, this I love these ch the chapter break art. I'm like every piece of chapter break art has been just chef's kiss. Mm -hmm. Good shit. Good shit. Let's see, um, have a bit of, have a bit of a bit of flavor text in the first column, and then we get into the dis the description of species as well as the as well as the chapter contents and where it and where it is. I always like mm -hmm. when games do this. Yeah. And it notes, species are broken down in the following way. Age, height, speed, special traits, and ancestry. Mm -hmm. Or special, special comma traits? Special traits and ancestry. I'm not, no, I'm not sure what that's like that for, but I'm sure we'll find out. Yep. Um, you get all the abilities under your species traits, but you only choose one of the ancestry paths to use. Now our first species is the Celestia. Oh, there are opening flavor texts to each to each one. I am totally voicing these, Monk. <laughs> well, it's, it's time we bring back that gimmick. Go right in. <clears throat> Curious beings, the Celestia. They were born in a realm without form, yet are beings of form. They are devoted to their cause and unyielding in their resolve. We know little about them, but we know of one thing for sure. They have a goal in mind, and they pursue it relentlessly. Of course, in every war, there are traitors. Celestia traitors are the worst of them all, as they give up their goal along with their soul. Excerpts of Philideus, Chapter 2. 
The Celestia are a group of beings who hail from the Celestial Realm, a formless realm of wondrous beauty. Celestia have no natural form, so to exist in our realm, their essence drifts within a vessel crafted for their specific plan. Little is known about the Celestia and their existence. To the average eye, they are a thin layer of glass that holds an infinitely rotating universe. Scholars know now that it is a glimpse of their realm, and, uh, and it all hovers around a central point called the Essence Core. This is their soul and personality storage core. Upon death, their memories and re experiences return to the Celestial Realm and the Celestial Being they originated from. Contrary to their appearance, they are a rather tough species that has been known to survive quite a beating. They are a naturally curious, beautiful, and noble species. This tends to get them into trouble quite often. Yeah, the curious thing would be would be to get them in trouble. The noble thing, depending on how it goes, can seem like arrogance. So I could see that getting them in trouble as well. Um, I'm not going to make an elf joke about them because because I don't think it. I don't think these the they apply as elves. No, it's Azriel from uh, Helltaker. Uh. Azriel the angel from Helltaker. That's exactly what this is. Beautiful, noble, and curious. And so she went to study demons in hell. Yep. <laughs> anyway, because since they're from the celestial realm, they do not have a home world. Celestia do, however, have the third largest fleet in the galaxy. Celestia often join adventuring groups looking for those who would best assist them with their plan, though in times of war, most of them will rejoin their fleet. All of a sudden, now I'm thinking Quarians. Do they have... I don't think they have ship names, but okay. I don't know if they have ship names, but uh, they all have a giant-ass giant fleet that they all go back to. Mm -hmm. And they're all in a form of protective suit, because that's the only way they can exist outside of their place. What little the Celestia reveal about their history is carefully notated by scholars. The Celestia have mentioned one thing that has managed to pique the scholar's curiosity. They tell of a great being that wove the celestial realm together. With a single word, he crafted the four celestial beings. He gave the original four beings the ability to observe the central realm. They told him in the highest reverence, and are, they hold him in the highest reverence and are his faithful servants. When a Celestia is born, one of the four celestial beings sends a goal and memories of the central realm through the veil. Iloa will craft a vessel for the purpose or be placed well, to be placed to be placed or will send the goal to one of his prophets or the voice of the Celestia. Celestia spawn in various places throughout the stars. They can materialize on random starships or on planets and stations that would best assist them in reaching their goal. Quarian Gundam Meisters? <laughs> Four celestial beings! Monk! Four Gundam Meisters and Gundam Double O! It fits! I'm going to be that meme from It's Always Sunny with the strings and the pictures right now. <laughs> anyway, all Celestia have a core goal that they were sent to achieve. For the most part, this goal is like a conscience. On occasion, however, Celestia have been known to abandon this goal altogether. When this happens, they slowly lose their soul and compassion. They become, as referred to, a to by a Celestia shaman, empties. Empty of drive, devoid of soul, empty of existence. So, communists. Now, now, monk, let's be fair. We can't give the Celestia a bad name by comparing them to communists. Because at least these ones aren't actively trying to oppress the rest of the Celestia into being empties as well. Okay. Um, black pills. Yes, doomers. Definitely doomers. <laughs> Let's see, then we go with the appearance of the Celestia. Celestia have a humanoid body shape. They typically have ears and what looks like a chin, but no other facial features. No hair, no eyes, no mouth. Instead, underneath their crystal clear skin, they have what appears to be a swirling galaxy. This galaxy stretches throughout their whole body structure. At the center of their structure, where a heart would typically rest, 
is the eye of the galaxy. The center is a bright and beautiful star that conceals their whole essence, their uh, essence core. While they take on the form of a humanoid, they also have no real hands. Their hands appear as rough spheres that barely hold their shape until they grasp something. These shapes will shift rapidly into the required shape needed to hold the intended item. Even though they have neither eyes nor mouth to be seen, they easily communicate with other species. Whether they speak through telepathy or something else is yet to be determined. The lack of eyes seems to hinder them in no way. In fact, they're often more observant and mindful than other species. You know, I have to, I have to wonder here, just because of those particular physical traits, how disturbing they must be because it's it's clear that with a that being a green screen for a giant galaxy is going to fuck your body language mm. and having no face is going to fuck your facial language and having no mouth means that however you're talking is going to make everyone a little on edge and having no eyes is also going to make everybody on edge because they're not going to know if you're looking at them or not how how close to quarians are these motherfuckers? Are they ostracized? <laughs> um, I remember, I remember, I remember one, I remember one species in Endless Space Two that was a sen were essentially ener were essentially um, energy beings, though more like energy <laughs> vampires, within containment suits. And these guys kind of feel the same, yeah. Let me s give give me a moment. And I can and I can try and I can try and dig up um the the Vodiani. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It it seems like there's got to be some sort of in-universe consequence for being what is essentially the fragment of a god because it comes from his celestial beings that give a goal. And those celestial beings came from God. Um, thrown into a containment suit to go do a specific thing. I mean, obviously from the name, they're, they're meant to be angels, basically. Mm -hmm. oh. Then how, how, to, how to name a star? Celestia are usually... Usually are called by planets or constellations, or given a nickname by their companions. Some examples include Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Andromeda, Corvus, Venus, Eris, Haumea, Ara, Carina, etc. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Stats. They live until their core collapses, so around 600 years. Their average height is 4 to 5 feet. Wow, they're short. Six squares as far as is their speed. Language they speak, read, and write common. They also know the exotic language of Koavi. And okay, now There's... now I understand the whole special thing from earlier. Yeah. They do not require oxygen, food, water, and are immune to the environmental effects of space. So if you want to be someone who can be air who can be uh, spaced through an airlock and survive. Celestia might be your choice. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have their traits. First is the Celestial Mandate. You have a goal ever at the back of your mind. Choose five skills at creation that will help you meet your goal. Once every four rounds of combat, or every five minutes outside of combat, you may add an auto-hit die to any of those skills' checks. This may bring you to three auto-hit dice on your chosen checks. That... So this can put you above the auto hit dice threshold. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, so you choose five skills at creation that help you meet your goal. So you have to you have to choose five skills that deal with whatever your mandate is, and obviously that's going to probably be decided by some of the things you talk about in your background and other things like that. Mm -hmm. See, next is celestial providence. You can rip a tear into the celestial realm. Upon doing so, you link the life force of adversaries together. Once per day, you may link up to five targets together and then designate one as the main target. Anytime the main target takes non-area field damage, 
The others take 50% of that damage as pure damage. This The links last two rounds. And if you remember from when we discussed rules last week, pure damage is unignorable damage. It, it is not blunted by any type of defense. That's, uh, that's kind of fucked. I'm going to link these five together, and instead of labeling the big bad boss who has probably a bunch of, uh, bunch of defenses as the primary target, I'm, I'm linking this tiny little shit right here that is obviously one of his minions. So that he just takes 50% of whatever we do to this minion and can't ignore it. <laughs> Let's see, and next is the Observers of Reactant. You start with the awareness expertise, plus 10 max HP, and plus 2 skill points. Well, damn. Let's see, and then we have the then we have four ancestry paths to choose from: the essence of Eridan. The Celestial Eridan is linked to the Arcane Current. The power flows through all that are connected to the Eridan's core. You add plus one to an Arcane Virtue of your choice. You gain an auto-hit die on Arcanting checks and an additional Novice Level spell. The Essence of Dr uh, Draca is, is the father of Sophic, the Queen of Dragons. The es and is and is an essence of power and might. You gain plus one in power or finesse. You also learn the unique ability Draca Flare. This ability allows you to unleash the heat of a star. This area field is a six square cone in front of the user, or a three by three field around the user. All beings within that field, other than the user, must perform a contested vitality check, or take player level plus vitality in fire damage. On a success, they take half damage for round cooldown. Is it is it wrong of me that I want to DBZ style shout Drake a flare? <laughs> oh. Next is the essence of Orion. The celestial Orion is gifted with a sharp mind and the ability to manipulate portals. Those with Orion's essence gain plus one to mentality or judgment. They can now you're thinking with portals. <laughs> They can also open a small portal at will. Inside, they can store up to 15 medium-sized items. It takes half movement to open and withdraw an item on, in combat. So, it's, so they get a free, they get a free bag of holding. <laughs> a free bound to them, only accessible to them bag of holding. Mm -hmm. And then is the essence of Vela. Vela is the celestial of free choice and justice. Those with Vela's Essence add plus one to two virtues of their choice, but gain minus one in another virtue of the GM's choice. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> <sighs> so, that's, a to, that's a good way to mitigate min-maxing when it comes to that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but it does say in another virtue, so they can't fuck with the two virtues you just added plus one to. Yeah. But so there's there I, I think with essence of Vila, you could still like if you were trying to min max, you could pump two stats to five, and then one more stat to four, and leave the rest at three, and then use this to pump those two stats that are five to six, and the GM would be forced to either bring your four stat down to a three or one of your three stats down to a two because they couldn't fuck with the two that are at six. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Interesting. Yep. So, the next race we have is the Dalkindrith. <laughs> the Dalkindrith are a beautiful but sad species. Imagine what it must be like, never be able to touch any living creature outside of their own realm. They carry a heavy burden, and so few accept them. Vampires, they call them, a name based on an old human story. The Dalkindrith have many woes and concerns, but they are ever the stronger for it. I only hope that one day our society will view them as more than monsters. Excerpts of Philidaeus. Mm -hmm. 1,000 years <clears throat> after the humans' great fall, a new species was formed from the frozen ashes of Everchange and a rib of Silvana. That sounds very, very 
very setting specific. Mm -hmm. The Dal Kindrith thrive upon the frozen lands of Everchange, dwelling inside a grand citadel known as the Phantasm Capital. At the citadel heart, heart rate, race a techno arcane device, the Insanity Drive, a <coughs> device with the ability to read and manipulate the shifting magic flooding Everchange. As the device reads the shifting strands, it teleports the citadel to the safest predicted landing zone in the realm. This device protects citadel denizens from the madness outside, a haven to both the Dalkindrith and explorers. This constant relocation introduces a slight navigation problem. To keep track of where the citadel will next appear, the Dalkindrith use an item known as the Navigator. This sophisticated device uses the Insanity Drive's prediction and tracking allowing the user to find their way home no matter where home went. So... It's like a mobile Komara? <laughs> I mean, they're inside a zone of madness using the magic of that madness to move their city around, and... Definitely sounds like a city in the warp, just one that moves. Mm -hmm. The first, eh, the first exploration. A few hundred years after the founding of the Phantasm Capital, several Dalkindrith began exploring their realm. One group stumbled upon a strange portal. They were hesitant to activate it, but decided it may be best to know what lay on the other side. Through the portal, they were shocked to find a new land, the Central Realm. White flakes fell from above, cold to the touch. Tall trees and green needles enveloped the portal's exit. After the expedition crew's report was read, a team was sent to set up an outpost on the other side. Shortly, a small castle-like structure stood watch over this gate. As the snow began to melt and the light rose, the Dalkindrith explored the land around the portal. This was when they first encountered humans. The initial encounter was cautious. They never met beings so like themselves and yet so unlike. Soon after entering our world, the Dalkindrith felt something they had not before. An unshakable hunger gnawed at the back of their minds. Their technology shorted out, and they harmed the wildlife around them just by touching them. This frightened them. The, wor the realm of Everchange was not this way. To resolve this, they crafted, crafted gloves of steel ice. These gloves prevented the dangerous effect, though the hunger remained. Unfortunately, the discovery of the source of their hunger came too late. One of the, one of the envoys between human and Delkindrith gave in to the, des the desire. He brought his victim to the edge of death. He hunted a few others before he was captured by the other Delkindrith. Too late for rumors spread of a monster lurking in the woods and towns of Transylvania. They were then cursed with the name Vampire. The Delkindrith left, fearing what might happen should they stay. With the rumors spreading, the Dalkendrith decided to close every portal they discovered. Locked away from the Central Realm, they hide within the cold steel walls of the Phantasm Capital, far from anyone they could harm. Their ruins remain to this day, castles crafted of frozen steel to guard where a gate once stood. Formed in the frigid Everchange, they are immune to the cold of the Central Realm. Instead of sweating in ambient temperatures above 68 Fahrenheit or 20 Celsius, they exude a liquid substance that instantly freezes and cools their body temperature to a comfortable 12, negative 12 degrees Celsius or 10 degrees Fahrenheit. They can, they can live to be 400 years of age. Their average height is between 4 to 6 feet. Their speed is 6 squares. They speak, read, and write common and may learn two additional non-unique languages. I know they don't want to be called vampires, but, um... Oh, it gets worse. Jeez. I was... You know how I was... You know how I was comparing the... The Celestia to the... Vo, to the Vodiani? Mm-hmm. I think these guys might be more accurate. Now, as far as traits, the first one we have is consume energy. A child of Everchange does not require food or water, but outside of Everchange you must consume the energy of an arcane, electrical, or living source. To do this, you must touch the target for at least one minute. You gain satiation time based on what you absorb. If you do not feed, you begin to weaken. Each day you do not feed, you lose 10% of your max HP. 
Once reaching a negative 50 year max, minus 50 year max HP threshold, you reduce your vitality virtue by two instead, minimum of one. When you are satiated, add plus one to your vitality and you gain plus 10% max HP. So Dal Kendrith is slightly risk reward in that respect. Arcane and electrical, consuming all energy in a medium-sized electrical or arcane item, satiates for eight hours. Animals and monsters, consuming half the max HP of a living animal or monster, grant satiation for two days. Sentient mortals, consuming half the max HP of a sentient mortal being, gives satiation for five days. Full consumption, consuming all HP of a sentient mortal or animal slash monster, keeps you satiated for three times the standard and grants a five-point energy shield, but kills the creature. So, could you then fight to a point of debilitation, but not death, in order to restrain and grab onto a creature and eat everything inside them? Regard... I th um, regardless of it, it still takes a minute to hold it, so you'd have to hold it for a minute. Well, that's why I say you you fight them till they're debilitated and then restrain them. You know, you tie them up. Possibly. That's what I'd do if I were one of these things. I'd only kill I'd only kill the things trying to kill me. Mm -hmm. um, transfer energy while in the realm of interchange, ever change, or with a strong enough connection to Sylvana, the aspect of change. <laughs> You instead transfer energy to the non to to non Dalkindrith. Touching a being transfers your life force to them. You can transfer up to seventy five percent of your current HP to another being. Transferring more than fifty percent of your current HP will knock you unconscious for three rounds in combat or one hour outside. This can be performed twice per long rest. Transferring energy this way grants satiation for four hours. Hmm. So you at least have some way of some way of staving things staving things off. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third trait you get is cold hearted. Dalkindrith are immune to freezing damage and effects such as frost such as the frostbite spell, and can and can thrive in cold to approximately two hundred below Celsius or four or below four hundred Fahrenheit. <laughs> And I'm trying to think if I'm trying to think if there's anything that would be th that would be that co that would be that cold. Um, that's slightly colder than liquid nitrogen. Yeah. By slightly, I mean eighty degrees colder. <laughs> but then we have and then we have ancestral um paths these the species of born of ever change granting them both a blessing and a curse all right one that first is the blood of the victim your destiny is tangled with the arcane current in such a way that you absorb another's destiny lines. When something goes wrong, you are typically the prime suspect. Because of this, you have a minus one in charm, but a plus one in mentality and power. The blood of fixation, you're obsessed with something. What they, what they are obsessed with is up to you. You have a minus one in judgment, but a plus one in finesse, plus one expertise at character creation, and an additional expertise point at levels... 4, 7, 11, 14, and 17. Inter interesting. And you have the blood of Porphyria. Your character... Porphy Porphyria. Porphyria. You are dramatically weakened by solar effects. When standing within a star's light, roll with three auto-miss dice on not on non-attack-based vitality. Vit vitality, power, and finesse checks. Mm -hmm. 
add plus one to your mentality, judgment, or charm and roll with an auto hit die on skill checks that use that virtue. That is Blood of the Martyr. You automatically absorb 10% of non-pure damage dealt to other PCs around you once every four rounds. Gain plus two vitality, and you may reduce the auto-miss chance allies receive by one. Cannot reduce it below one, but have minus one in power. That's, um... These ancestral paths are weird. <laughs> It certainly fits the theme, but still weird. Mm -hmm. Then we have a then we have a fifth one that you can take as an alternative, called the Curse of the Sanguine. You have cursed your own blood from the first taste of that red life force. You may only feast upon a sentient being when consuming. Perform a tough mentality check. On a failure, you consume the full energy of the target, killing them. You gain a minus one in your mentality, but gain plus one to power and plus one bonus level to four skills of your choice. If you fully consume a target, you add plus two to your vitality instead of plus one while satiated. So if you if you pass the mentality check, can you still choose to perform a full consumption and get those uh, mentality, power, and bonus levels? It looks... It looks like it looks like. Um, I know we made the joke about Kamara, but this feels like the un this. I'm getting a vibe of the un of an unholy union between Kamara and the Blood Angels. <laughs> now they they don't they don't steal enough things for them to be the Blood Angels. I said Blood Angels, not Blood Ravens. Um, true. Blood angels, blood ravens. One's got white wings. One got one's got black. What's the difference? <laughs> see, next we have I'm... the Elon, the <clears throat> eh, the pr the proper space elves. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> no, we are not immortal. We are ageless. Our minds and bodies never age. We never grow sick. But our souls eventually leave this realm. In their course, all Elan fade and return to the arms of Elanoth. We greet that time with open arms, for old Elan never die. We merely fade away. Excerpts of Philidaeus, Chapter 4. The War Children of Elanoth. The Elan, or Elves as the humans often call them, are a brutal, ageless, and militaristic species. They guard each realm ga gate that leads directly to the central realm, defending against all manner, typo, of corrupted creature. Though most other species forget, the Elan hold back enemies from the realm hub, fighting back the legions of demons and keeping them at bay. They're the fucking Eldar! <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I actually, I actually can't call them the Eldar in this case, Monk. And that's because they aren't snobby enough I Monk they're the Cadians <laughs> I'm not kidding they're holding back everything at the Eye of Terror they're the fucking Cadians Any, anyway Elan are born from one of four bloodlines of the Elaren, or First Lights. Each bloodline has a blood gift that all Elan learn to control and use on the battlefields. The Elan army is filled with the most brilliant tactical leaders and fighters born with a natural talent for war. Elan from Adreth live in brutal combat, training for inevitable battles from a young age. Even so, not, Ella, not all Elan joined the army, instead journeying down another path upon reaching 21. The majority of Elan are born in, El, in Elanath's home realm, Art, Artareth. Adareth. 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 Yeah. This realm is an ever-expanding plain of trees and mists. The Elan cities are large mobile war citadels that, warm the en that roam the endless forests. Mysteriously, the realm shifts the ground. All who wander this realm become lost. Only the war citadels have found a way to work with the shifting forest. 
See, Monk, they're fucking orcs in elf bodies. <laughs> well, they're not. They're not born. They're not born from fungus, but I didn't say orcs with a K, though. I just said orcs. Mm -hmm. They're probably smart. They're probably smarter than well, orcs with a C. Although, although are are we going with Tolkien orcs or are we going with Warcraft orcs? Yes. Fair. <laughs> Next, anyway, Elanath, who was given the title of Mother of the Elan by Eloa, taught her children to respect all life that Eloa creates, from the trees and grass to the creatures and mortals. Few outsiders have seen her, but all agree that her beauty exceeds words. Elan are always born under a light of Adareth. Day, night, twilight, or arcane. Those born under day's sun have lighter skin, bright eyes, and tend to be taller and more muscular than other Elan. Many make up the army's juggernaut strike teams. They fight with speed and ferocity, using the sun's warmth to strike with the purest flame. Elan born under the darkness of night tend to be slimmer and prefer, and prefer subtlety. They excel as spies and assassins. They handle the subterfuge of the army, hiding during the night so so much that the target cannot see them before arrow or dagger pierces them. Those of the night are more talented with ranged weapons. So the the children of Vulcan and the children of Corvus Corax got it. Those born during the arcane hour are the prophets and war chanters. Their ability to silence all magic makes them an essential part of the army. Those under, born under arcane have powerful figures and their hair has strands of many colors. Their eyes glow with an intensity of one of the four primary arcane elements. While the majority of Elan are born under day or night, some are born during twilight. Those born under this faint light have enormous power. They are born with infamous black wings, reflecting the wings of the fallen. The energy that runs through their veins can inflict direct damage to those around them. Other species cannot tell a twilight Elan from another Elan, their wings are only visible to mortals when they awaken their power. They strike terror into their enemies and are only called upon when the galaxy desperately needs them. Otherwise, they wait in silence, hidden the hidden and lost children of Elanoth. So, we have the children of Vulcan in the day, the children of Corvus Corax in the night, the children of, Ma of, of Magnus the Red in the Arcane, and the children of Sanguinius in the Twilight. <laughs> Very few mortals live for eternity. While the Elan are descendants of the Elaran, they do not live forever. Instead, their souls are what we call ageless. They can live to be at most 3,000 years before their soul and body leave this realm. That means they could potentially outage a Celestia. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Names of light. The Elan names are given to them based on what light they were born under. And we have some male and female examples for day, night, and twilight. Looks like a lot of star names, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we have their stats. So the age cycle consists of youth, birth to 50, adult, 51 to 1300, elder, 1301 to 2000, Elan Grace, 2001 to Fade, the oldest being 3000. The average adult Elan range between 5 feet to 7 feet. For those born to, to the sun, their average heights can be anywhere from 7 to 10 feet. Glad to see there's, glad to see there's someone who, who, has, who would have bigger, tall person problems than we do, Zan. Yeah, but Monk, so far this race sounds exactly like us. <laughs> but they're elves. I hope that gets under your skin. Yes, it does. <laughs> they speak, read, and write common and Elanan, the simplified language of the primes. As far as traits, we have ageless kin. So when you pick your age, you gain bonuses and negatives based on it. Young, plus two squares of base movement, plus one to vitality, and minus one to virtue. Adult, plus three skill points, Two auto miss dice on judgment skill checks. Elder, 
plus 8 skill points. When you level, you no longer add your vitality virtue to your HP. You instead simply add 2 plus class HP. Oof. And Grace, you gain the effects of Elder plus 4 skill points, plus 1 to Judgment and Mentality, and minus 1 to Power, Finesse, and Vitality. You know who else this reminds me of? Who? Since I mentioned one or one of them earlier, this is um, this is the Asari dude. Yeah, can't I can't argue with that. Oh. Then we go into descendants of spirits. You're a descendant of one of the four elder Elon. Oh. The choices you have are Da'ath, Spirit of Knowledge. You gain an additional expertise point, and when you reach the advancement training levels of your class, you gain an additional expertise point to use. Nice. Philidas, Spirit of Adventure. You may sprint as a free action and ignore its negative effects once every two rounds. Jesus! The guy I've been imitating with a with a weird mixture of accents is sprint however much you want. Nice. Philoset, Spirit of Wisdom. You gain a bonus die on contested judgment checks and start with plus two max determination. Oh, so it's the uh, Undertale Spirit. Got it. Mirabelle, Spirit of Existence. You start the game with the Mystic Spell Creation may have five creations under your control at once, and each creation can last up to one hour. Jesus. And the last trait that you get is Ancestral Blood Rage. Once per long rest, you may activate your Blood Rage. For five rounds, gain plus one bonus die on attacks, and take 10% less damage from oncoming attacks. Or incoming, sorry. Damn. Then we have Ancestry Paths. So we, you can either, you have to pick between the Mark of Shemesh, i.e. Day, i.e. Day, add plus one to either power or charm, gain plus one auto hit die on contested charm checks, roll with auto miss die on analysis and observation checks at night. You may re-roll a critical miss on a melee attack once per short rest. Nice. The Mark of Riak. Add plus one to either finesse or mentality. Add plus one bonus level to the covert skill. If you already have plus one in covert, add an additional auto hit die to your checks. Roll an auto miss die on analysis and observation checks during the day. You may re-roll a critical miss on a ranged attack once per short rest. Very so that's cool. That's going to get useful when you get fucked by the dice gods. Mm -hmm. Because you will. Mark of Goma, add plus one to any arcane virtue and choose the path of Arcanting or the path of Connection. Arcanting gives plus one bonus level in Arcanting, and you roll with plus one bonus die when performing Arcanting checks. Connection Elon can sever the arcane current once per day. When the connection is severed, all non-allied magic and magical effects cannot be cast until the end of your next turn, and any non-superlative, out-of-control spells are concealed. Cancelled. Cancelled. Yeah, so... The font the font makes A's look like O's from a distance. My bad. Um, Mark of Sholas, Twilight. Those born under Sholas walk between light and dark. Add plus one to a virtue of choice. Gain the Awakening ability. Your character has black wings that grant an additional plus three squares of base movement and a fly speed equal to your max movement speed. You may access Jesus. your cursed blood and immediately heal ten plus half player level in deal. Oh, sorry, deal ha ten plus half character player level in chaotic damage to all adjacent adversaries. You may use this cursed blood ability once every three rounds. Jesus. Adds three squares to to your base movement, so base movement as we said was six squares. Mm -hmm. So you get nine squares base movement, and then you get a fly speed equal to your new max movement speed. So now you get a fly speed of nine squares. Remember, remember what we read about how flight works. Yeah. 
that, that if you're taking off, you can move up to your max movement speed and then move an equivalent amount in the air of, of your fly speed. Mm-hmm. Or that if you're still flying, it's a combination of the two. Or that if you're landing, it's uh, taking off in reverse. Mm-hmm. 18 squares of fucking movement in the air? Jesus! We've seen fly movement in the past, but but it's I don't think I don't think it's ever been handled quite like this. It hasn't, and it's also it's also never been so like useful. this this yeah this seems like it would be super fucking useful. Yeah. And next is the exiled. Ghost stories aren't always cheap tricks. Sometimes the stories are true, terrifyingly true. Some among us are remnants of a previous life, not who we once knew them to be. Their memories are there, but their souls are not. Do not be fooled. They are strangers and not old friends. Deal with them carefully. They may not know who they are. Excerpts of Philidaeus, Chapter 6. The Prime Realm Enscape, also known as the Aether of or Death's Embrace, is a land of memories and thought, a world of twisting darkness and light. Travelers to Enscape recount tales of a maze wandering into eternity. Memories they never had suddenly come flooding back. Emotions fade and the world grows darker. Before long, the traveler awakes back in this world with no knowledge of ever traveling back. The few scholars who have dared to venture to Enscape return with confusing accounts and muddled memories, yet none of these effects are strange. Enscape is where memories of the fallen are materialized. The guardian of this realm, Death, is a being of calm finality. His realm reflects this and cannot accept the living for long. Exiled hell from the realm of Enscape. When an exiled spawns in the central realm, their souls are filled with a memory of a deceased mortal. Together, these essences perf- produce a new being, an old memory given a new form. This species is looked at with some fear and reservation. Like the ghosts and stories, they possess a haunting glow and can transform into an ethereal form. While the exiled look like the being in its given memory, they have little knowledge of that being. Most of the old memories are lost in the veil for all time. Only the strongest and most passionate memories survive and pass on to the new soul. Often, their interaction with this world causes both old friends and adversaries to resurface. Revenants? Um, or nobody's. N- neither. Um, I mean, it's probably closer to nobody's and heartless, but this is actually something I I can't make a direct comparison to, because mm-hmm. this is this is this being is an amalgamation of some soul or souls. The memories of one soul stamped onto the form associated with those memories, but then the memories, but only a few of those memories are transferred. And there's a lot to it here. It's a very interesting. That's a really good hook for the only narrative. One I could possibly think of is the homunculi from FMA, and even that's not what. That's not close. It's not. Yeah, it's not a one for one. I. Uh, is the most I no no I have one I have one okay shit I'm why didn't I think of this before different source of power different purpose but same idea the uh, somniums from Better Man they eat as they to become a Better Man or to maintain a form as a Better Man. They have to eat a specific type of animus flower, mm-hmm. uh, a seed from the animus flower, the seed of Vitali. Mm-hmm. And, and it grants them the form and some of the strongest memories of the persons who the person whose flower they ate, which is why um, Better Man Lamia looks like Hinoki Sai's older brother and tries to protect her from time to time because those are the things that remain of her older brother. Mm-hmm. But it's not her older brother at all. I think that's the closest one we're going to get. And even that's a bit of a deep cut. Yeah, it's a, it's a stretch, and you have to know a lot of lore about Better Man, and you have to actually know what the hell Better Man is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, 
Many have heard of the Guardian of the Afterlife, but few have seen him in the Central Realm. He dwells in the veil between this life and the next, shepherding the departed into the beyond. Ruaneth, Death, is the patron saint, voice of the exiled, and the husband of Elenath, Life. While his counterpart works her magic in the realms beyond Reactin, he guards against evil attempting to pierce the veil. While some escape, many others meet da Dathia the Reaver, Ruaneth's scythe. Death protects Enscape and destroys evil, so the central realm of Reactin may continue living. Only two species within the Veil of the Void cannot return to this realm, the Celestia and Transferred Prototypes. Upon returning, most of the species look as they did originally, but two species completely changed. When the Topkin returned to this realm as an exile, their form is twisted and no longer covered in beautiful forestry. Instead, they take on the appearance of a forest spirit, typically wearing the bark of their old life as armor. They take on a spiritual glow that flows through the bark, an energy holding it all together. When Reapers return, they are fully twisted by their experience and become Enscape Reapers. Their robes shred and glow under the hood, and the glow under the hood shines an eerie green light with two eyes that glare into souls. This is currently the only known way for Enscape Reapers to spawn within our realm. When an exiled spawns, they appear in random places. This could be where they originally died, or perhaps on a planet where the veil is thin between Reactin and Enscape. Sometimes they spawn in space on ships that pass by an area where heavy casualties were taken. Even, mech even Mechromancers will occasionally help draw in an exiled from beyond the veil. A planet that is well known for spawning the exiled is the Dead Planet. This planet exists on the very edge of the Shadow Scar of the so on the Southern Rim. Thousands of years ago, the Shadow Realm burst into Reactin, killing billions and creating the Shadow Scar. The Dead Planet is a reminder of this past, and a gateway to a volatile system of shadow and ether. Many exiled spawn here, and a small community of them calls this planet home. Not all memories that attract essence in the land of the dead are decent. On occasion, a memory of a corrupted or evil being fights its way into this realm. The memory consumes the thoughts and ethereal life force around it, forming a new body. It pierces the veil without death's approval, twisting into a grotesque beast. These beasts are referred to as wraiths. They stalk and feed on the fear of their victims. Once the victim's soul is worn down, they devouring it, transferring transforming into a being of terrifying power with a lust for control, a Mortum Dominus. Oh, that got, he that got heavy quick. <laughs> so the, beef, the beast is a wraith, and then when it's, once it wears down and d devours the soul of their victim, they become a Mortum Dominus. That's a, that's a great way to make a villain. They are, the, they are the age of their last single recalled memory, whether right before death or an earlier age. If you're making this character from a deceased character, you may roll 1d6. Even results indicate they are younger. Odd results, they are the same age. Their height depends on their species. They have six squares of speed. They speak, read, and write common and the unique language of Durali, the language of the dead. You do... You do not require food or sleep, and you start with the resurrected expertise. And then they have some in interesting some. traits. So, first one is Denizen of Enscape. You, or at least a part of you, is from the cold halls of Enscape. Gain resistance to ether and frigid damage. Then we have Ethereal Form. You may transform yourself and all items you are wearing into your Ethereal Form at will. In this form, you may move through adversaries and objects, including walls. You cannot end your movement inside an object or unit. This form lasts and can be switched between for an hour, after which it goes into a cooldown for two hours. You cannot move through something that prevents ether abilities. While well, in this form, anything with the ether workings expertise rolls with plus one bonus die on attacks. 
Um, when it comes to that ethereal form, all I can think of is Raziel. Yeah. Let's see, then species remembrance. After you choose what species your exiled once was, you may choose a trait ability from that species' traits. For example, if you make a human exiled, you may choose between gifts of the soul, survivors, or blessed are we. So that means if you, for example, created a uh, an exiled Elan, you could potentially give yourself the descendants of the spirits or the ancestral blood rage. Yes. Or I think the, mo the most interesting one, actually, out of the three that we've read prior to this, would be giving yourself um, something from the Celestia. But the Celestia can't come from the, the realm in the first place, which is why I'm guessing why he did that, was balance issues. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it also makes sense, you know, within the narrative, but... Yeah. Then we have Ancestry Paths. The first one right. is Determined Memory. Add plus one to any virtue, add plus two bonus levels to a skill that uses that virtue, and gain an additional expertise point. Difficult Memory. Your memories are hard to, be are to bear. Add plus one to Vitality. You cannot be affected by sleep, fear, and madness. Gain an additional plus five hit points at character creation, and 1d6 HP every level. Additional plus 1d6 HP yeah. every level, yeah. Contemplative memory. Gain plus one to judgment and mentality. However, you always go second to last in the initiative order. Could be useful, depending. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then jovial memory. You were... You add plus one to charm, you gain plus you gain one bonus level in performance and speech craft. People are no longer cautious or scared be of your eerie glow unless you want them to be. <laughs> I mean, if you're a jovial memory, maybe your glow isn't so scary but is much more inviting. Mm -hmm. um, we have and there's a there's a couple that are specific to certain races. A floral Though creation. Um, yeah. Which is topic in o which is topic in only. Add plus yeah. one to any virtue. Your spirit is now free form and ethereal, granting you plus two bonus levels in dodge, and you may ignore two reactionary strikes every long rest. Ignore two AOO every long rest. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, and and these are I'm guessing that these these uh. Paths are there because of how becoming an exiled twists a Topikin or a, or a Reaper. Yeah. Oh. And as, as far and speaking of Reapers, that's the other tr that's the other path. A new creation. You are now a Reaper of Endscape, but on but only your most potent memories remain intact. Add plus one to any virtue. Gain the ability to apply the curse Finality on a target once per long rest. The finality the target is overcome with a feeling of dread and fear. An illusion of death spawns around them, and they go prone, completely terrified. They remain prone for two rounds, and all allies gain an auto-hit die on attacks against that target. Upon waking up, the target rolls with an auto-miss die on their next check. I, um... I can imagine you using that on, on something, uh... Big and threatening. <laughs> Possibly. The next we have good old humans. You want to know about a human, huh? Well, never have I come across a more bullheaded, self-centered, volatile species. They are the newcomers to Reactan, and they love to start fights wherever they go. But at the same time, the species can be incredibly passionate, proud, and caring. So many of them will see a cause and strive to do what is within their power to help. Yeah, they tend to be crazy, but to be honest, we're all crazy. Excerpts of Philidaeus, Chapter 1. Humans are the first chapter in his excerpts? Nice! 
Humans are known as the Children of Eloa, a newer species to reach the stars. Only a thousand years ago, they crafted their first interstellar starship. Their relative youth makes them eager to prove themselves among the more mature species. War seems to run through the blood of many of the humans. They can be an aggressive species, even against their own kind, yet even more are caring and compassionate. They can be a very smart species, able to change the universe for the better. They are also incredibly diverse and unique, currently the third most populated species, right behind the Elan and the Koryans. Their, origi their origin world is Judah. The human's home world is Judah, nicknamed Eloah's Jewel. It is a planet that was once flowing with water and blooming with the finest of vegetation. However, after a massive arcane tear caused a devastating explosion, Judah lost 75% of its majestic landscape. Now, while their empires lie in ashes, only 25% of the land is full of lush plant life. Arcanum leaks and dangerous rips in time frequently occur. Here, Arcanum and technology blend. A special barrier was created by the most brilliant minds of science and arcane who worked together to protect what was left of this Eden. Five years after the arcane tear event, there was a mass exodus of humans colonizing neighboring planets. They now control the majority of the Atali system. However, the land of Judah still holds their primary seat of power, the Conclave of Eden. The Conclave is made of 16 representatives from the four courts. Court of Understanding, Court of Rivalry, Court of Arcana, and Court of Commonwealth. Each court is made up of a group of houses. The houses in the Court of Understanding are the House of Technology and the House of Knowledge. The House of Technology is made of the most talented groups of mechanics and inventors. The House of Knowledge is filled with chronologists and historians. The Court of Rivalry is broken into the House of Offense and the House of Defense. The House of Offense is home to the fighters and generals who are bred for times of war. Many soldiers make up their ranks. The House of Defense is filled with the strategists and defenders of Judah. Many strong bloodlines of field knights hail from this court. The Court of Arcana is held into the House of Connection and the House of Destiny. The House of Connection contains humans with a natural affinity to magic. Many Thalmatechs fill their ranks. The House of Destiny is fi filled with potential prophets and the voices of the primes. The Court of Commonwealth is made up of the House of Citizenry and the House of Nobility. The House of Citizenry is home to the, most, to the, mo to the common class citizens. This is the most populated group of all, out of all the houses. The House of Nobility is home to the nobles and diplomats of the species. So, we... I... <laughs> Uh, does he write on the HFY subreddit? I don't know. I'll have to ask him. Because, frankly, this is starting to read like an HFY entry. And, it's also and... longer than, like, this section has been longer than any of the past species we've we've looked at thus far. At least the, the history section. Mm -hmm. oh. <sighs> anyway. I love it. <laughs> Long ago, humans had a direct link to the arcane current. Naturalists and arcanters were quite a common factor in the old history of humans. However, that all changed when once the human began abusing their powers, the magic corrupting and manipulating them. This power began corrupting the, ver the very arcane current itself. To prevent the human's demise as well as the corruption of the current, Eloah removed the human's link to it. Eventually, the last mages died out around the medieval period, and magic became a myth, much like the stories of elves, dwarves, and fairies alike. Shortly before their magic was taken, the other species, such as the Elan and Corians, left Judah. Humans had grown aggressive towards the things of legends, so the others decided it was best to leave them to their own fate. Somewhere in that duration, humans were all but forgotten, becoming the legends themselves. Why am I reminded of the Omega Man? Mm -hmm. uh, humans thought they were alone for so long, always wishing th there were more out there. They explored the stars for some time before finally their signal was received. It was then that the aliens known as humans were once again introduced to the others. Their arrival was the calm before the storm, and their choices would affect all of Riek of Riekton. 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 Many cycles came and went before humans were given access to magic once more. 
new mages were coming out of the woodworks, and the elder mage Merlin returned to shepherd the novices. With his help, the arcane court was formed. Now they studied the arcane current in detail, showing extra interest in the potential uses of arcana tech. Their spell academies are focused on the proper training and educations of those with a powerful connection to the arcane current. The House of Connection works alongside the House of Technology here to train all potential Arcanters on the use of magic and tech. Human history is full of war and pain. Many humans have given into this past and have become mercenaries, pirates, brawlers, and fighters. They are the species that gives into the temptations of the faces all too quickly, yet they are also filled with those who desire to do good. They are a double-edged sword and their past is riddled with war. We hope they do not repeat it. They probably will. It is often whispered among the other houses that the House of Knowledge has secret dealings with the Enigma Consortium. They often travel to forbidden places, ignoring the dangers to get what relics or knowledge may be left. Whether or not they truly work for the organization is unknown, but the other houses always keep an eye on them when they are involved. Their, na their names are various and dependent on where they grew up and who they know. The naming scheme follows our own and has no standard. I mean, they're humans, of course. Yep. Reach adulthood at 21. Reach Elder Age around 95. The oldest is 200 years. Average build heights between 5 and 7 feet. Mm -hmm. Speed 6 square. Your species speaks, reads, and writes common. You may choose one other language to know. Then we have the traits. First is, blessed are we. Once per day when performing a test of difficulty challenging or less, you may instantly succeed and it co and it cause a critical success roll. Bit of a typo there, but okay. Not it, It's not. You may instantly succeed it and cause a critical success roll. Ah. It's saying you can succeed the test and cause a critical success. My bad, I misread. Oh, next is Gifts of the Soul. The children of Eloa have been granted special gifts. Choose one of the following. Fides, Divine Persuasion. Additional plus one bonus die for Charm and Mentality Contested Checks. Erakara, Steadfastness and, and Tenacity of Purpose. Plus one bonus die for Power and Vitality Contested Checks. Oevet, Plus one bonus die to, for Judgment and Finesse contested checks, and Survivors. Twice per short rest, if you start a combat with no determination, you get three points back. Damn! Like I told you, this sounds like an HFY entry. Mm -hmm. See, then we have the Ancestral Paths. Even if you do not, did not grow up on Judah, you are part of the court. So we have the Court of Arcana. Add plus one to an arcane casting virtue of your choice. If you are not using an arcanting class, you gain plus one bonus level in arcanting. If you are playing an arcanting class, you add an, an auto-hit die when casting. And once per short rest, you can cast a novice spell for free. God damn see, the Court of Commonwealth. Add plus one to Vitality or Charm. Start with either 4,000 credits and the Expertise Noble, or, four, or plus four max determination points and one Expertise point. So either start out rich with, and an Expertise Noble, or start out fucking hard to kill. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Let's see, then the Court of Rivalry. Add plus one to power and finesse. Add plus two to a non-successful die on attacks that use your chosen virtue every four rounds. And so if you add plus one to power and you have plus two to a non-successful die on an attack with power every four rounds. Mm -hmm. Jeez. Next is the Court of Understanding. <coughs> Add plus one to, menta to mentality or judgment. Gain an additional three expertise points at character creation. <laughs> wow. 
Let's see. Next we have the Korean. Oh, man. I get to do a different accent. <laughs> but that's only because it's a quote of a person inside the excerpts. Mm -hmm. Oi! What do you mean we're supposed to be short, eh? You need to stop listening to them Aries and their good-for-nothing stories. Well, except that we're the best forgeness in all the realms. Right, that you can believe. Those were the words of Gavin McKenzie. Excerpts in Philidaeus, chapter 8. <laughs> They're blue dwarves. Yep. <laughs> the Corian species is a hardy group of four-armed, flame-touched humanoids. Each Corian is born with a brand of the eternal flame on their very soul, though it manifests differently for each Corian. This could be a dark, burning flame in their eyes or veins of lava running up their arms and legs. Corians have a strong sense of honor and respect for each other. Corians hail from the arcane-touched planet of Morrigan IV. They are the sources of the human lore of dwarves, though their heights can range anywhere from four to eight feet. The only thing the Corians really share with the old lore of dwarves is their caste system and ability to forge. Corians are the greatest forge crafters in the universe. They use their soul's eternal flame to forge powerful weapons and armor for those who respect the craft. They serve those who are not only willing to pay, but those who show the respect the weapon is due. Each Corian made weapon holds the soul of the eternal flame as much as its maker. Corians are all born with an identifying rune on their skin. No one is quite sure what precipitates runes or why they appear when they do at the age of 18. Each rune separates Corians into a family. Corians are typically strong-willed and very defensive of their family group. Family groups are not necessarily related by blood. Instead, the, the family is a group of those who have the same rune, serving one another in ideas and talents. Not all Corians adhere to this family system. Some reject it or leave because of tragedy. These Corians are deserters, known for abandoning their family and letting their rune die out. The fire within them grows dark, only a spark of what it once was. Since Corians have the essence of flame within them, they are naturally attuned to the arcane realm. They use this connection to produce powerful and unbreakable weapons. They inscribe ancient archaic runes of the elements onto every hilt and blade they craft. Corians are masters of the old, of the old runic enchanting. Corians typically only have a first name, as a last name typically means the Corian has been banned from the caste family system. Their names follow Norse names such as Baldur, Asta, Dusty, Egel, Einar, etc., etc. They may accept the name of their family rune or trade, however, adding that to their first name. Example, Baldur or, or Aenaid. Baldur of Aende, yeah. Of Aende. They live to, at most, 600 years. Fledgling is birth to 18. Smith is 19 to 300, and Sage is 300 to 600. The max, their max height ever recorded was 8 feet, and their smallest was 3 feet. Quite the variation. Mm -hmm. Six squares of speed. They can speak, read, and write common and the language of foreign, language of the forge. And then we have the special. You have four arms. You may have four items slash weapons ready at one time, though this does not give innate additional attacks. If you have six plus vit power or vitality, you can dual wield two-handed non-great weapons, and with eight plus power, you can dual wield two-handed great weapons. <laughs> oh man! Imagine making a Corian just to aim for dual wielding two-handed great weapons. Um, and with the dual wielding rules as they are, that's actually pretty fucking cool. Okay, now now let me take that and raise you one. A Corian with two dragon slayers. So just guts combined with himself. Got it. <laughs> Eight feet tall, four arms, blue, bright red lava on the skin to represent his fucking rage. I'd do that. I'd totally do that. Let's see. Cor Corian traits. Enchanters, you gain access to runecrafting. During a long rest, you may focus on an item you have crafted and place a rune on it. This rune makes the item magical and allows it to inflict the damage of one of the four arcane elements alongside its regular damage. Yes. 
So we have Flame Forge Smiths. You gain the expertise Forge Smith and Deep Connection. As a Channel 3 action, you may use all four arms, focus on your Flame Connection, and form a ball of heat between your hands. This heat is hot enough to melt metal and forge items. You can maintain this field for two minutes before it collapses, and it cannot be used again for two rounds. And strike the iron. Once per day, you may manifest the greater flame within your soul. If you do so, all adversaries within an 11 by 11 area field centered on you take 10 plus 2 times player level in fire damage, inflict burning, and reduce their armor by one level, minimum light 2 armor, for 2 rounds. You know, <laughs> that last one there... I feel like comparing these guys to dwarves is an insult. No, no, they're they're dwarves. They're absolutely dwarves. Uber very ma dwarves. very magical dwarves. But the monk. Just uh with strike the iron. I would want to be really flippant <laughs> and go. So you see, you want to know where you are and who you're facing. And inevitably, the answer would be, well, you're facing me, and I am the Iron Man, and you're in my forge. <laughs> and then you strike the iron and catch them all on fire. Yep. Now then we have the ancestry paths which are go which I guess are going to be the cast runes for for the, for the Corians. We yep. have Ined the rune of passion plus 1 to vitality or charm plus 1 bonus level to performance and speechcraft and once per short rest you may reroll a critical fail. Then we have Ardare the rune of fire. This rune appears Add plus one to an arcane virtue of your choice. Gain the expertise spell blade and two apprentice level spells of your choice. Nice. Um, brand, rune of forging. Plus one to power or mentality. And plus one bonus level to crafting and mechanics. Of course. Let's see, then ember, rune of remains. Add plus one to any virtue of choice. Gain the expertise Prodigy, Pro, Prodigy and Pro Ageless. And once every four days, if you would drop to zero HP, heal to one HP. So every four days, you have um, Monster Hunter's famous skill uh, that makes it so that you can take a, take a, a death hit once. Mm -hmm. Second nice. chance. Well, I don't know if it's called second chance in Monster Hunter, but I don't yes. think I don't think it is. But I've seen that kind of thing in R in RPGs. A RPGs lot. called second chance, yeah. Not everyone calls it that, but I just call it that out of habit. I think it's called feline moxie in most games because mm -hmm. it's a food skill. Yeah, prevents fainting one time when damage taken exceeds your remaining health. It's moxie. Mm -hmm. So. It gives you, it gives you moxie, shunny. And la the last rune is Kenna, rune of Paragon. Add plus one to judgment or finesse. Refill your determination to half max every session. Holy shit! Determination only gets refilled by GM Fiat. Remember. Mm -hmm. GM says, oh, this is a good point to you for refill your determination points, and refills it. Or, like, half max determination every session? I mean, you know, humans also got the whole three determination points twice per short rest if you start combat without any. So that's, you know... Humans and, and Corians, when it comes to determination management, you have some options there to really fuck with determination management. See, next is the prototype. Mm -hmm. Now, I gotta say, 
for their name, they look exactly as expected. <laughs> <clears throat> were they not created? They were crafted by his hands, as you were. Is their processing so different from your mind? Is flesh required for life? They think and feel as you do. They are alive. They are their own masters. Excerpt of Philidaeus, chapter 5. Where he explains that God built these robots! God damn it, then they are God machines. They are Machina ex Deus. Machines from God. Anyways, the prototypes took their first breaths 4,000 years after the great fall of the humans. Eloa moved once more upon the realm of Adarath. With refined naturium, or for infused with a purified crystal of Nautric Arcanum, Eloa molded a new being of both metallic and organic material, a techno-organic. Eloa placed these creatures in the central realm upon the planet Technomata. Unlike the older species that came before the prototypes, they were built with a mechanical and organic brain. After rapidly advancing their technology, they reached the stars, only preceded by the Elan. Prototypes have the innate ability to morph their frames into other frames of similar build, such as transforming their figure to that of an Elan. They cannot change their, their aesthetic outer covering, but can replicate the face, shape, and structure of other mortals. Why does this just remind me of Alchemical Exalteds and the Autocathon? Because, that, because they are. <laughs> <laughs> Even though uh... they are a techno-organic creation, Eloa gave them souls like the rest of his creations. While they have a soul, it isn't solely bound to one body. They can choose to transfer their soul into a specifically designed robotic chassis that can hold their soul as, as they near the end of life or earlier point. When a prototype's soul is transferred to a new chassis, it, is no, it no longer requires food, water, and oxygen, but becomes vulnerable to hacks, programming attacks, and cannot use the arcane. This new form is known as the Techno-Transferred Chassis. While the prototypes keep this transfer process concealed, other individuals have discovered ways of transferring a soul to a Techno-Chassis. So there's, there's, there's that limitation that they were talking about about um, prototypes not being able to be exiled if they're transferred. Mm-hmm. Prototypes have an unmatched understanding of technology. They are the ones behind many modern-day spaceships, warp engines, even transportation gates. Their designs are seen throughout R- Rikton, Reactin, sorry, and have and they have a massive impact on techno- technological advancement. They see how every machine operates, able to commune with its systems to improve or fix issues. To them, coding is what they do and speak. It's natural and is why they can create such amazing machines and codes. Technology is a part of them. Oh, Jesus. Since it's the... a race of autists. <laughs> Since the factory disaster of M4R4, Mara 4, many rogue prototype designs are roaming the stars, each unit designed to hunt, collect, and kill. That factory has yet to be shut down, not for lack of trying. Its many defenses and counter hacks have long since protected it. All the while, it keeps producing monstrous robotic creation. The A-551N units being particularly nasty. Um, Monk. A-551N assassin. Mm-hmm. Because why not? <laughs> <sighs> Let's literally... It, if they had put in a second 551, it would have been too obvious, obviously, but... Regardless, um, that apparently leaks into their naming scheme. (laughs) Naming a prototype is rather simple. They have a letter and a series of numbers after it. The letter represents their their design type. Example, the P and P250 could stand for pilot. 
Prototypes often have two names. They have their design name and then a common name. Like F-R33 and free. The design name is used primarily within and among their species. You know what this means, right? The Yorha androids could be prototypes. <laughs> yeah. They absolutely could. They'd all be transferred prototypes. Mm -hmm. Um, But this also... This also means that, Monk, you're going to have someone who names their, their, their robot, whatever it is, L for uh, leader, maybe, 337, and common name is Leet. I'd be disappointed if someone didn't, didn't already try it. I'm sure someone already has, but I had to point out that that exists. I might be a smart ass and 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 just name it just name one J one one seven. What role does the J stand for, Monk <laughs> Jarhead? <laughs> <sighs> Any, anyway, they can live up to six hundred years. That's, there's that number again. In their original and, biotech form, before the natric metal collapses, transferring their souls into a non-organic body adds another 400 years per each transfer. After two transfers, the soul will fade. Each transfer reduces their mentality virtue by one. So they can live a maximum of fourteen about of about 1,400 years mm -hmm. until their souls fade. Man... You know why humans are so awesome everywhere else? They're short-lived. Yep. I think All right. I think they're only long-lived in Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, Homeworld, and um, Warhammer. I wouldn't exa and I wouldn't exactly call Warhammer humans awesome. I mean. They are another example of HFY, Monk. Yeah. Warhammer and Warhammer 40k are actually kind of responsible for the for the, the stem of HFY. Mm -hmm. But uh. <sighs> Any, anyway, their height depends on their model type. Not typically above nine feet. Jeez, a nine a nine foot tall a nine foot tall Yorha mo model. That's gonna be that's a scary thought. No, no, no! Don't go there, Monk. No. Stop. There are already people with Amazon S fetishes out there that have already drawn nine foot tall two Bs. Anyway, speed <laughs> speed for for um zero to two legged models, six squares. For three to four legged models, eight squares. And now somebody is thinking of a centaur two B. They can speak, read, and write common and datalith. And as far as traits, the first is biotech existence. Based on if you use the original model or transfer to a techno chassis. So for techno organic, you do not require sleep, but you require a two hour recharge every three days. You may eat and drink as normal. Can be, he can be healed by both organic and mechanized healing items. Or techno transferred, you do not require oxygen, sleep, and food or drink, but you do need a one hour recharge every day. You are immune to the effects of space, but are vulnerable to hacks and programming checks. You cannot cast magic or invest points into our canting unless you take the installed arcane replicator ancestry path or find an arcane replicator item later in the game. You automatically fail our canting checks if you do not have the replicator. You cannot be healed through methods that heal organics, i.e. meta shots, medic medicament, etc. Instead, healing mechanics checks and instead requiring mechanics checks and repair kits. Repair kits may heal you up to four times per day. Next, you have living metal. Regardless of chassis, you at you may add cybernetic enhancements to your body. You start the game with a special cybernetic enhancement that you and your GM determine. It cannot cost more than ten thousand credits. Nice. 
And next, last is Elite Hackers. Gain one bonus level in programming, and once per day, you may auto hack nearby auto nearby autonomy. Ah, uh, sorry. Ah, English monk. Automated or mechanical things, allowing you to control the units and use their functions for four rounds. This could be a turret, a robotic guard, etc. You can control up to two units. Advanced AI perform a contested mentality check. All prototype gain plus one bonus level in mechanics or programming. And then we have the ancestry paths. So we have installed arcane replicator. Gain plus one to an arcane virtue of your choice. Gain the gain an auto hit die when casting and automatically cast one known spell for free per day. Installing this replicator gives a techno transferred prototype access to arcanting. I'm glad it has bonuses besides just giving a transferred prototype um, arcanting. Mm -hmm. It has a use beyond that. That's that's a good way to keep it relevant regardless. Yes. And then the rest is all what you would expect to do with a PC. Mm -hmm. Upgraded hardware, plus one vitality, and a built-in two-point energy shield. Adversaries that attempt to hit you do so with minus one bonus die. A upgraded logic core, plus one to judgment. Start with four additional expertise points. Jesus. Upgraded processing unit. Add plus one to a virtue of your choice and plus one bonus level in two skills that use that virtue. Nice. Upgraded RAM. Add plus one to mentality. You may use the commit to memory and remove slash share memory three times each per long rest for free. Roll with plus one bonus die on all knowledge or recollection checks. Upgraded servos. Add new servos to your chassis. This grants plus one to power and finesse, but draws more power from your system. If you fail a skill or check that uses power or finesse, you roll with minus two bonus die on your next check. And this this does note that it's other than attacks, mm -hmm. um, which is good good to note because some people may just think all checks. Yes. Then upgraded software. Upgrade some of your internal software. This allows you to start one level higher than the starting level. Jesus. <laughs> See, then we have Reapers. Okay. Why am I... Sudden. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just looking at these pictures. I'm like, huh. Edgy boys for edgy times. Have you ever seen the chaos that unfolds when a reaper bursts onto the battlefield? The skies darken and terror flows. Their sights, they cut through metal. Their strength and brutality are terrifying. And breathtaking. Breathtaking. Excerpts of Philidaeus, Chapter 7. I think he said breathtaking twice because he was trying to make a pun. <laughs> Their scythes take your breath away. Yes, they do. That's for sure. Reapers are not the old creatures from human lore, neither angels of darkness nor reapers of mortals. Reapers are powerful mortal creatures spawned from the realms beyond our central realm. Reapers materialize in a realm of existence, or in some exceptional cases, a prime realm. There are six known core realms that Reapers materialize from. Order, Chaos, Shadow, Reflection, Arcane, and Presence. Each realm is a reflection of the central realm, highlighting certain aspects of it, each distorted by the void. Each realm has its counterpart. For Order, there is Chaos. For Shadow, Reflection. And for Arcane, there is Presence. Reapers are born to their element and strengthened by it. On rare occasions, a reaper will form within a prime realm, usually Adareth. Most other prime realms are so potent that few reapers could stand the manifestation. They're elementals. Um, I mean, partly. Yeah, partly. 
Uh, well, no, no. Only one of them is Elementals, Monk, looking ahead. Reapers are often found wearing long robes or thick armor, only revealing their faces which reflect the aspects of their realm. Reapers of the Realm of Shadow often wear a long hood over their heads to hide a swirling shadow concealing the those of reflection often so, ah, have reflective crystals growing from their armors, forming a protected barrier where two eyes of purple gaze into mortal souls. Reapers of the Realm of Arcane are composed of one of the four elements, air, earth, fire, or water. Their souls echo this element, taking over their forms. Often they wear enchanted robes and are filled with elemental magic. Ones who call presence their home are typically found with intricately designed armors, many of them covering their faces completely with ornate helmets. Order Reapers are in perfect symmetry both in mind and body. They are master strategists. Finally, those rare few who form an Adareth don mighty war robes, furs, and other natural elements. What about Chaos? We missed Chaos. We got Shadow and Reflection, Arcane and Presence, and Order, and then one in the Prime Realm. Ah, never mind. The Central Realm of Reactan has not produced a Reaper in over 2,000 years. It is theorized that it lacks the power for a Reaper to spawn. The Chaos Realm may have produced a Reaper in the time since, but after the War of Faces, the, ca the gate to Chaos was locked. Yet whispers and signs suggest the lock is weakening, to which the Order Reapers are preparing for their inevitable clash with their chaotic siblings. There we go. That's, that's all I wanted to know. They live lo no longer than 500 years, but have no age cycle. Max recorded height is 7 feet, speed 6 squares, they can speak, read, and write Common and Rema, the beat of the realms. Their traits are Realmic Advantage. You do not require sleep and gain an additional plus two skill points at creation. You gain protection from the damage type of your ancestral realm. While within your realm, roll with plus one bonus die on all checks. Realm Weapon. All Reapers are born with a weapon that represents their realm. All weapons have a base damage of 1d6 and use your class's primary virtue to attack. They gain additional 1d6 damage every 5 levels. This weapon has one augment slot and inflicts your realm's damage type. It may take on any weapon's appearance the user desires. A ranged weapon has a 6-12 square range. And lastly, Rending Swing. Your weapon is not just for show, it can rip between your realm and this one. Once per day as an action, you may charge your weapon and send a great slash in front of you, 10 square line. All beings within this line immediately take 4 times primary virtue in realmic damage. A rip in the veil then appears where you slashed. Adversaries that pass through this field take 10 realmic damage, last for 3 rounds. While you stand in this field, you gain the bonuses of your realmic advantage ability. So you cut open a small portion of of the the prime realm or the central realm or wherever you are. Central realm sounds like it's the main stage. Mm -hmm. um, and create a small little field of home that also absolutely fucks everyone else there. Nice. I like it. Mm -hmm. Then we have ancestry paths. Realmic birthplace. Unlike the other mortal species, Reapers are typically born out, outside. Sorry, that that's not that's not one of the ones. That, it's it's the it's the meta type for the ancestry paths for Reapers. So you have Adareth, Prime Realm, and those the the Reapers from that wear robes crafted of vines and bark and have great bright green eyes. Add plus one to vitality or mentality. All healing items used by you gain an additional use. Learn two novice spells from the Natura tree. Oh, nice. Arcane. The realm of Arcane is where all magic originates. Its energy weaves a connection between all realms. Those born in this realm are secret keepers and lore masters. You gain plus one to an Arcanting virtue. You have a natural ability to manipulate the Arcane current. Once per long rest, you may sacrifice your reaction to cut the arcane current threads. 
This inflicts 10 plus 2 times player level and elemental damage to all adversaries in combat. Nice! The r then we have Order, with a place of pristine beauty, structure and design permeate the realm. Order Reapers have clear minds and are quick to react. You have plus one in mentality and judgment. At character creation, gain one skill point. And we have the Realm of Presence. No secret remains hidden here long. Those from this realm tend to be the practical thinkers and truth seekers. Add plus one to a virtue of choice and gain the expertise Virtuous and Prodigy. Your realmic damage is pure. What? <laughs> Present? So, pre Presence Reapers basically just to get to hit past all defenses with their fucking realm weapon? And with their rending swing? That's kind of busted. See, then reflection. Light, sound, heat, and arcane are dis are distorted and manipulated in the realm of reflection. Those from this realm are observant and adaptable to their surroundings. Add plus one to judgment, add plus two bonus levels in insight, and plus two max determination. Nice. And the realm of shadow, where reflection reveals, shadow conceals. Those born within this realm are naturally gifted with fast strikes and obfuscation. Add plus one to finesse, gain one bonus level in covert, and once per short rest, you may automatically covert yourself with four hits. Jesus. Let's see, then we have the Topikin. Palmon, is that you? <laughs> Calling them plants is an offense to their true nature. To us, they appear to be walking trees or overgrown flowers. They are truly souls who inhabit a plant host, as wild and untamed as the forests of the galaxy. In the few wars they have participated in, they quickly dominate the battlefields. Their control of nature is their gift as the children of nature. Excerpts of Philodeus, Chapter 3. The Topikin are beings that embodies nature that embody nature's will and wrath. I was gonna I was gonna make a hippie joke, but I don't think that applies. Flower power. They are the caretakers of the wilds. No one really knows save the ancient Elan when they were created. However, they only just recently started playing a big part in the galaxy outside of their home world. The forest of their homeworld is as majestic and untamed as the beings that inhabit it. They're a cautious species, so very few have seen their world. Fewer have set foot deep into its roots. While little is known of their politics, we do know they are governed by the Mother Tree. Topkins spread their forest, Malatvan, as they go to new worlds. Malatvan magically appears when a large group is on a planet, reacting wildly to magic, both good and tainted. Topkin's beautiful exteriors disguise strong and terrifying fighters. So, so, they're governed by the Mother Tree. Is this Secret of Mana? I have a feeling it's a Secret of Mana. Remember, his mom became a tree. Yeah, this, this, this possibly is Secret of Mana, just with better combat. <laughs> yes, I said it. Deal with it. That whole, that whole wait for it, that whole do nothing and, that, and then get one attack before you have to recharge the thing, that was fucking stupid. It wasn't that bad. I didn't like it. I don't like it. I, I don't like, um, I don't like combat systems that demand that kind of inaction. Mm -hmm. It's the same reason I don't like, I don't like, um, I don't like beat em ups that do the whole do not, do nothing in order to, in order to block. I understand. But anyway, demons of old discovered just this when they attacked the Topikin world of po of Poplar Cross. Many say the war for Poplar Cross was won by its forest. The Topkin weaponized the twisting bows of their forest to strike down the intruders of their home world. Poplar Cross and twisting bows. 
Mm, nice. The Topkin world, homeworld is encased in dense forest with a massive mother tree consuming the planet. No one knows what their world is called, as its name consists of sounds and vibrations that don't exist in other languages. In common, it is called Migodon. Topkin are given a spirit by Eloa and, and grown a body by the mother tree. And I get to make one of my favorite jokes. Every rose has its thorn. Come on. You have no idea how old that song how old that song got when I was a kid. <laughs> Actually, you probably so, do. I probably do, but it's still a good song. Oh, it still it still is, but then again, closing time is still a good song and I, and any time I hear that, I get pissed off. Anyway, rails. While the majority of Topkin channel, channel tranquility of the forest, a sect is filled with spite and anger. This group, this group is known as the Wrathfilled. They are the deadliest Topkin fighters, rarely seen or heard from due to their secrecy and subterfuge. So are these Topkin, would you say that they might, uh, they might be the nettles hidden in the forest. Much as I hate to admit it, yes. <laughs> Topkin travel through a spirit path linking all of Maltavon together. Depending on the forest spread and how many spirits are in the roots, traveling may take time. The spirit roots are all connected to the mother tree, Migodan, Adareth, and the root citadel. These roots are precious. Should anything evil befall it, the universe would be in danger. So, so wait... Is this is this implying that you could planet hop with a Topikin without being in a ship? Possibly, possibly. Okay, I and like once that again, idea. I'm remind, once again, I'm reminded of Endless Space Two. Specifically, let me see if I can if I can find them. Monk, I have a. I have, I have a better... I have, this one you actually will like, I guarantee it. I have a better euphemism. What? A tree with many roots extending into many realms. It is Yggdrasil. <laughs> yeah, it is. I was going to go with the Unfallen form Endless Space 2. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, like, literally what is described here is Yggdrasil. It's fucking Yggdrasil. Mm -hmm. Ugh. <sighs> That the all Topkin may leave the central realm and transport their souls to a place known as the Root Citadel. This citadel is the heart of the Topkin homeworld that exists between realms. It is possible for other species to travel there if they are deeply linked to the arcane current. Non Topkin mortals must be careful when going there, as the spirit roots of the mother tree bend, leading many wanderers to their doom. Topkin have no gender and are called by their flower or bark type. For instance, Dahlia, Antonio, Rose, Petunia, Wren, Zinnia, Oak, Fern, Lilac, etc. That means you could have multiple li Lilacs and multiple Dahlias, multiple Oaks. Mm -hmm. oh. Topkin go through stages of life based on seasons. They are in the young stage from birth, at fi from birth to five years. Adult stage from 6 to 45 years, and the elder stage from 46 to 125 years. Ah, the only race thus far that is uh, less long-lived than humans. Which is, can, which is interesting, because usually when you see plant people or, or their equivalent in settings, they usually end up being pretty long-lived. Fuck the ants. Yeah, except, yeah, fuck them. They're yeah. long. They're long. Li they're long lived because they're myopic motherfuckers who ca who take an entire day to come to a decision on something. Myopic, neurotic, and slow. Mm -hmm. As my men as my mentor would say, they're so slow they got to speed up to stop. Mm hmm. Anyway, traits. First one is forest kin. You do not require food or sleep but you do need 15 minutes of exposure to sunlight 
primary or simulated, to be satisfied for a full day. You require a glass of fresh water every day. Each day without water, your max HP is reduced by 10% to a max of 50%. Um, we didn't... I don't think we went over their height and everything. Oh, right. They have never grown above 8 feet tall, speed of 6 squares, and they speed... They speak, read, and write common. They also know the unique language of Natura Media. There we go. Mm -hmm. Anyway, back to traits. Next one is Strong Bark. You start with built-in natural armor. This armor can be upgraded as time goes on. This is typically done through a tough crafting and arcanting check using an arcane wood. For example, the Bark of the Mother Tree. This bark is <clears throat> heavy armor with a rating of 4. Upon taking damage in a round, your, your armor is reduced to medium until the end of the round as your bark regrows. You take plus 10% additional damage from fire. Well, no, you think? There might be a few, there might be a few trees out there that are resistant to fire and use fire to germinate their seeds. This is a real thing. Go look it up. Fuck you, I'm not explaining otherwise. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, foliage no like fire. This is why grass types lose to fire types in Pokemon. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the last trait is the last march. <clears throat> A strong connection to nature allows you to spend your channel and action phase to summon two tree guards to defend you once per day. They attack with vine swords using your weapons mastery or are canting and deal two times primary virtue and natural damage. They may place a 1 by 9 wall of vines with 40 HP to block adversary movement slash damage, and can call forth the world roots of the mother tree once per combat to grasp all adversaries in combat for 3 rounds. They have 100 HP and take plus 10% damage from fire attacks. These creatures last 5 rounds and are controlled by the GM unless you give them a direct command. Now, that last part there, I'm sure there's probably going to be some parts about, you know, GM's not fucking with their um, players, like summoned, uh, summoned constructs like this in a way that would make the game unfun for them. Mm -hmm. So, so I think leaving it up to a GM could really be, you know, it it, it might. It's just like having NPCs in the battle, essentially. Mm -hmm. Like the only time you'd really need to direct them is to say, "Hey, put the wall there," so that they put the wall there. And, or, or, hey, call forth the world roots so that you get the grasps. I don't think you'd really have to do much more beyond that. Or at least if you have a good GM. Mm -hmm. And, let's see that. But I do, I do like the fact that they can, that they can, that they can summon buddies like that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Free guardians. And with 100 HP, not bad. There is also there is also the fact that they, that I don't see any once per once per day or once per every few days. So it's um once per. I see it once per, once per day, but after maybe... they last five they last five rounds. But even so, five rounds is a is a good amount of time, especially for guardians with a hundred HP that can do uh, quite a few good utility things. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. So then we get the ancestry paths, which are season based. First is Aviv, the season of spring. Add plus one mentality or charm, plus one to the medicament skill. If you start with a plus one in that skill due to a class you chose, you instead roll with plus one auto hit on medicament checks. Once per short rest when a player is down, you may give them a death hit. Let's see, then we have Bayet, the season of summer. Add plus one to power and finesse. However, you start with only three expertise point points at character creation. Yeah, uh, because you don't know the trials of winter. Mm -hmm. Then we have Stav, the season of autumn. Add plus one to judgment, gain the expertise prodigy, 
and gain plus one expertise point at every advancement training. Oof. Then we have Zoret, Season of Winter. S um, add plus one to vitality. You also gain immunity to the environmental effects of space slash void and resistance to ice slash frigid, da frigid damage. Once per day, you may cast the Harsh Blizzard Arcane Water spell for free. Ooh. And Yore, the season of rainfall. Which interesting. So in other in other words, th in other words, those tree folk who are born in Seattle. Or Oregon, just like any part of Oregon, except for maybe Bend. Mm -hmm. Or part or parts of Asia during monsoon season. <laughs> or parts of Japan during typhoon season. Yep. Those Basically, any place there's any place there's lots of rain. Yeah. Those born to the constant rains have a strong have a strong connection to life giving water. Add plus one to a virtue of choice. They also can go five times the amount of time without the need for light and water. They are unaffected by the negative movement penalties of swimming in water and have immunity to water damage. Any incoming healing from water based spells or abilities heals for an additional fifty percent HP. Wow. And wow. That covers all of the races. You know how earlier we said we said that we were having a bit of doubt on that whole on that whole you can you can make just about any character. Yeah. I'm starting to uh, I think I think in I think when it comes to this setup just with the races alone, there's a lot of stuff that could be done. Yes. I've... There's... Yes. <laughs> some, of, I, some of the stuff my, is, is, highly bro is highly broken, but <clears throat> it can be done. And I don't mean broken as in, as in the, us is the usual OP. Even, even, some, even some of the more powerful races like the Reapers aren't a case of playing the game on easy mode. <laughs> Yeah, um... It's playing the I game think, on ridiculous, but not easy mode. Yeah. I think the... Of the... Of the the nine... Um... Species. Mm -hmm. The ones I'm most interested in... Are... Like, half of them? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is... This, this is ridiculous, Monk. We can't keep reviewing really good games. I'm never gonna. Ha I'm gonna have the the worst, the worst, the worst uh, analysis paralysis ever. Um. Yeah, but you're gonna have the good kind of analysis paralysis. I, it's still analysis paralysis, and it still bugs the crap out of me. But let's see. The five I am most interested in, and that's why I said like half of them: the Celestia, the Exiled. The prototype, the Reapers, and the Topikin. Like all the the stuff that is non-standard to most normal fare. You know? Mm -hmm. <sighs> uh, uh, I'm just like, and then if I had to f narrow it down among those five to like top three. Um, the exiled, the prototype, and the reapers. Like the Celestia and Toppykin are cool, but like the exiled, the prototype, and the reapers all give a very unique narrative hook. Don't get me wrong; so did the Celestia, but I feel like the exiled have a bigger impact there. I can I can certainly see it, but maybe I'm just a weirdo. I mean, I am a weirdo, but that's regardless. Mm -hmm. And even 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 with that, before we even get into classes, that's already that's already a few choices. And before we went live, we met we um we we had we had a bit of a talk about le about the about um choice that doesn't have as much point or yeah. doesn't have as much impact 
Yeah. I think it I think it's an interesting point of comparison to bring, to compare something like this to the to the amount of choice that we saw in um in le, in level up with it, with all the races where the choice choice was present, where the choice was present but it felt like it was taking something that would have been one one feature and splitting it. Quote unquote choice. As a, a to to quote a uh, very popular song by uh, Brental Floss, it's not really a choice when uh, it's not really more choice when all my choices suck. Whereas what we have what we have with this is the fact that while um. While the ancestry paths do have a lot of um, numbers go up, it's not limited to that. Yeah. And even the ones that are somewhat leaning into the numbers go up are only that because of the uh, because of the ridiculous stuff they're getting out of traits. Even that. Even. <laughs> the traits are. There's there's, monk. That is in. There's just some insane shit amongst these amongst every one of them. I'd say that out of all the races, the one that I think might be least played is going to be the uh, Dalkindrith, because their entire like species is it has a pretty large drawback with the whole consuming energy thing. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, all of their ancestry paths have both a positive and a negative, whereas many of the ancestry paths of other races most of those paths maybe only have a positive. Mm -hmm. Like, even... Even the humans, whose ancestral paths are, are what court do you belong to, um, just give you stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Even, even with... Even with all with all of that the 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 approach that we it is kind, it is kind of funny that we started off with the celestia but i think one thing that can i think one thing that can be said is despite this being science fantasy trying to apply the the racial dynamics of other science fantasy games that we've dealt with in, dealt with in our careers isn't all that applicable i mean what yeah I mean, yes, we reference we reference Mass Effect a few times. We reference fucking Better Man, which I did not have that on my calendar. That would be referenced tonight. Yeah, that was a bingo card entry from out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. But when I th when I thought about it, it's the most logical choice for the exiled. Saying, I think it's saying something that that you had to go that deep in order to find in order to find a um, parallel. A clo yeah, a close parallel. Because mm -hmm. all the other like. Maybe the only other uh, the only other um, parallel I can think of, and even then, it's not a good one, uh, is the um, oh, what were their names? Hold on, I'm gonna look it up really quick. Yeah, the the uh, Necromonger Empire from Riddick, since they were all things that were already half dead or all or had been through death to begin with. Well, only one. Only one of them was. Well, all of them are put through some sort so, sort of half death. Whereas the emperor himself was like full on, full like touched by death sort of person. But even then, that that, that, that it's not exact, and it's the better man thing still fits better to me. And when it comes, and I will, I will admit, I will admit, I admit, I made a few jokes here and there, but I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to grade the choice of species on on originality, but more on more on the fact that the the approaches that the approaches that e that each has, it's not, it is it is answering something that. 
I've had a bit of an issue with 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 races in in games. That being how they don't matter after af after um early game. Whereas these ones give you traits and such that'll carry you throughout the whole game. I mean, yes, with some with some of the, obviously the obviously the nu the number moving of, of traits and skills isn't going to matter too much once you're in, once you're in the teens levels, but there's other things within them that are that are going to matter. The expertise is the um the uh changes within the then like uh how certain things affect you. Mm -hmm. Uh for example, that that uh season of rainfall from the Topikin, <laughs> the fact that you take no damage from water water damage sources and that any source of healing that uses water gives you a 50% more HP than it would normally. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And then, of course, there's the whole, you, you last five times longer um, than you normally would when with your sunlight and fresh water uh, requirements. <laughs> it, it, is, it is definitely things that will affect gameplay for the entirety of gameplay. But I'd say I'd say I did say last week that that after get that we were gonna get into the juicy stuff in the coming weeks and well looks like I was right once again. Indeed. But next week we will be getting into classes, and the first one that we're gonna be dealing with is the architect. Yep. So keep an eye keep an eye out for that because that's gonna be fun. And I can almost assure you that uh, I'm going to make as many engineer jokes as I can, because God fucking damn it, the architect is is, is engineer. Mm -hmm. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.